Part 2. Geopolitics in Russian. What to expect Syria? S. Korsen, good evening everyone, Sergei Korsen, it's me. My guest today is Colonel General Leonid Ivashov. Leonid Grigorievich, good evening. L. Ivashov, good evening. President of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems now. Is everything right? Yes. And besides, a man with a hugely successful and glorious military career. As a service combat, and subsequently in various apparatuses, a military political career, let's even say so. Let's start with the hottest, I know that some time ago you visited Syria, the current hot spot where the situation has been seriously escalating lately. Who did you manage to meet, in fact, with the main, I would say, leadership of the Syrian Arab Republic? For more than two hours we talked with Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. We met with the Minister of Defense, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Information, the heads of the special services, and, well, with many, many experts. How in the field of information, war, perhaps, to call it? Information technologies. So it is with specialists from the special services, from the Ministry of Defense, and so on. Is there a feeling of anxiety or even panic, given the aggravation of recent times, because the Syrian scenario resembles, well, outwardly, at least, the scenario taking place in Libya. Well, we, the military, think in terms of operations, and we just guessed, calculated, in fact, completely the scenario of operations that the Americans nevertheless launched. Since April, when the representative of Hillary Clinton gathered the opposition in Turkey, such organizational work began. Then the Muslim Brotherhood, headquartered in London, began to stir, they began to form militants, including specialists from Iraq. And then, through the Turkish, Syrian-Iraqi, Syrian-Lebanese borders, they launched, as they say, the organizers of mass actions. And let's ask ourselves, and I'll ask you, why do the Americans need this? You understand, against the backdrop of what is happening in the entire Middle East and North Africa, this revolutionary uprising, Syria, firstly, is a strategically important crossroads. If you look at the map of Syria, it seems to be in the center of this Arab world. And there are even borders with Turkey, Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, etc. This is a strategically important crossroads. Secondly, let's take a look at the foreign policy of the Arab countries, the League of Arab States, even in general. In fact, all regimes, both monarchical and republican, are under the control of American foreign policy. They openly pursue a purely pro-American policy. And only Syria and Libya pursued such a policy, well, anti-American, or something. Yes, in general, European-oriented, I would say. Yes, European-oriented, but anti-American, anti-Americanism is strongly present there, this is connected with the events in Iraq, and with the constant American pressure on Syria, etc., etc. Therefore, there is a task to clean up this region in anticipation of some then big changes. And they will definitely happen in the Arab world clean up and reign in those countries that can become an example for future winners in these vague revolutions in Egypt, in Yemen, etc. This scenario is, in principle, understandable as you describe it, but nevertheless there are doubts about this scenario. The United States, despite the fact that it is the largest power, is very well bogged down in the war in Iraq, including. And the issue of the budget deficit for them now comes to the fore. Why do they need new investments and new problems in the Middle East? Well, by the way, quite a lot of major analytical articles appear in the American press on the topic that only a war will pull America out of the crisis. It will give some dynamics, first of all, to military industrial production, provide jobs there, etc. Most importantly, it will distract the population of the United States itself from internal problems. It's probably all there. And what, in fact, is happening is really a kind of paradox. The Americans are bogged down in their internal problems, they are on the verge of a technical default. In March, in April, the most powerful demonstrations took place in the USA in 50 states. Of course, little was said and shown about this in the world media, but we know about it, hundreds of thousands of demonstrations, and the nature of the slogans has changed dramatically. In the city of Madison, for example, the main slogan is, down with the oligarchic dictatorship. It's also restless. In general, the idea is clear, but what is Russia's interest in Syria? In general, we have had military political and technical cooperation for a long time and, 
as far as I understand, it is quite tightly established. And yet, what are Russia's interests in Syria? Let's be frank, which other Middle Eastern state is our backbone, our partner, let's not say strategic, but reliable partner? And in the economic sphere, and in the sphere of military technical cooperation, in the sphere of military presence? The Syrians are very kind to Russia. Every year I go there at conferences, at various forums, I meet. And, you know, people line up during a break after my speech, just to show that they studied in the Soviet Union, and they argue, you graduated from some polytechnic university there, I graduated from Moscow State University, etc. T that is, this respect for Russia, it is certainly present. That is, this is our kind of reference point. Well, look, we left, in fact, from Aden, our naval presence. In fact, it is absent in the Mediterranean and to the south. And only Syria for a long time holds the Tartars base for the entry of our ships. Yes, we have been modestly present there so far, our floating workshop was standing, our ships went there to be repaired, but they keep it. And today Russia has confirmed its interest in this object. Have we been supplying weapons to Syria lately? We supply purely defensive weapons, mainly air defense, anti-tank, etc. In general, the Syrian armed forces are very interestingly built with the help of our specialists. By the way, we have the largest foreign advisory apparatus. It is located in Syria. When I was the head of the main directorate of international military cooperation, 450 specialists, advisors and members of their families lived there. When was it? In what years? That was before. I was dismissed from the armed forces in 2002, but until 2002 I was the largest, and then, by inertia, they kept more. Now they have reduced it somewhat, but nevertheless, our military advisors are present in all branches of the armed forces, in the military academy, in headquarters, moreover, at the general staff, etc. That is, our advisors, do I understand correctly? Let's formulate the question clearly, participate, advise the leadership of Syria, the military leadership, how to deal with the rebels. With the opposition? No, no. This is out of the question. The fact is that, in general, the army today stands apart in this political process. She does not participate in the dispersal of demonstrations. And I met, talked in detail with the Minister of Defense, my old friend, and the army does not participate. The army serves as a cover for the Turkish border. The Turks first launched these militants through their territory, Muslim Brotherhood. In the north of Syria, the population was agitated, skirmishes were organized there, etc. And the population rushed to Turkey, there are about 10,000. And the army moved its main ground forces to the Turkish border, closed it and is now practically in a state of direct contact with the Turks. Do I understand correctly that the army does not participate in direct hostilities within the country, does not participate? First, the army is the first priority of the Syrian state. All military personnel are treated with respect and the army as a whole. And the defense minister insisted to the president that the army was not involved in these events. What was hoped for did not happen in the army. As happened in Libya, at one time, in Iraq, where part of the military went over to the side of the protesters. Did not happen. One colonel by the name of Assad left. But, as my colleagues told me, he was mentally not quite healthy, and somewhere about 14 soldiers fled, they simply deserted. The army is loyal to the current leadership and does not interfere in these internal political events, which gives it even greater authority. Let me remind you that in the program, No Fools, today Leonid Grigorievich Ivashov, President of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, Colonel General. Leonid Grigorievich, now actually to your conversation with the country's top leadership. What impression did Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, make on you, you know, a young man who deeply understands modern processes, and a man who has been at the helm for many years, ten years after the death of his father. And for at least five years he has been seriously thinking about reforming both the Syrian state and society. In order to give more democracy, more human rights, he has all this, but the main thing is to change the socio-economic situation. And his main theme is youth unemployment. Syria has a good education. Compared to other Arab states, Syria is the most educated country. Universities work well, by the way, they cooperate with our Russian universities, but after graduation, the problem of youth unemployment arises. 
and he puts this problem at the forefront, and you know how strongly he played, as it were, ahead of the situation which took shape first in Tunisia and Egypt. He proposed precisely the model of a new state, a new society, reform, but the following should also be kept in mind, the conservatism of the elite, most of whose members were still serving, working with Bashar's father, with respected Hafiz Assad, they do not want any reforms. The security service, because there was a long-term state of emergency there. And the security service has greatly strengthened its position and has become the most disliked service among the Syrian population. He, too, is now raising the question of the state of emergency, the regime is over, the security service must be reformed. We discussed this subject with him in detail. He deeply understands that an operation against Syria has been launched. This is not a spontaneous action, an operation has been launched. Here's to my conclusion that Syria faced an operation which the Americans are conducting, and this is seriously dangerous for her, he agreed and, secondly, he agreed that a new type of war cannot be waged in the old ways. We need new means, new ways, and by the way, during our stay, he demonstrated how he quickly changes the information policy, how he launches this comprehensive reform project, shifts public attention from political confrontation to discussion of the future, the future model of the Syrian state, the future economy and etc. And he does not hesitate to take responsibility for what happened. And he, you know, has a very high authority among all sections of Syrian society, very high. During our stay, he demonstrated how he quickly changes information policy, how he launches this comprehensive reform project, shifts public attention from political confrontation to discussion of the future, the future model of the Syrian state, the future economy, etc. And he does not hesitate to take responsibility on yourself for what happened. And he, you know, has a very high authority among all sections of Syrian society, very high. During our stay, he demonstrated how he quickly changes information policy, how he launches this comprehensive reform project, shifts public attention from political confrontation to discussion of the future, the future model of the Syrian state, the future economy, etc. And he does not hesitate to take responsibility on yourself for what happened. And he, you know, has a very high authority among all sections of Syrian society, very high. Do you get the feeling that he has a future as the president of Syria? Is there any confusion? No, no. He is sure, well, somewhere he asked me questions to check the correctness of his conclusions, and we did not just meet by chance, but his representative visited here in June. The Academy made an assessment of the situation that has developed in general in the Middle East and in Syria. And she gave a certain concept of a way out of this situation. And in the conversation, you know, surprisingly, he asked me, for example, to speak firmly with the security forces, with the heads of the special services. Why? because it is his father's old colleagues who are more conservative and do not want any serious changes. But especially the security service, and now he, taking advantage of the current situation, is implementing what he planned a few years ago. That is, precisely the reforms. What about other department heads? Let me remind you that the guest is Leonid Ivashov, President of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, Colonel General. This is the no-nonsense program. Do the leaders of other power structures, services, do they really give the impression of mastodons that are left in the past? Well, on the one hand, these are, of course, high professionals, especially the heads of special services. Well, the Minister of Defence is generally a respected person, he went through all the steps, for many years he was the chief of the general staff, he knows everything thoroughly. And he has absolute authority. And in him I felt a vision of the new. Heads of special services, Yes, they are professionals, but they still think in terms of the past. And what is happening today, they still cannot perceive as an integral complex operation. They are still chasing individual oppositionists, opposition leaders from abroad. But the modern ways of counteracting this, it seems to me, they have not fully realized. And I think that in the coming days there will be changes in the leadership of these special services. Because a new type of war needs new people who understand the essence of these actions, and we need people who can already work with really modern means. The same internet, you can't close it with the old methods. And to fight it with the method of prohibition, only to strengthen the power of this internet. So the president will pull the young into the service, electronics engineers, techies.
Let me remind you that the guest of my today's program is Leonid Grigorievich Ivashov, President of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems. The first part of the program was devoted to his recent visit to Syria and communication with the main military and political leadership of the country. I will start the second part with the second question on Syria, then we will move on to other topics. This is no fools, we'll be back in the studio right after the news release. Let me remind you that my guest today is Leonid Grigorievich Ivashov, Colonel General, President of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems. In order to perhaps complete the conversation about Syria, please tell me, Leonid Grigorievich, is it possible now in Syria, given the rather tense situation and the aggravation of this situation, the scenario, say, the Libyan one? Can, say, the Sun Security Council authorize a limited operation against Bashar al-Assad, against the current Syrian leadership, as was done against Gaddafi? Well, if you look at the behavior of the American leadership and the leaders of a number of European countries, they are really trying to push through this Libyan option. Look, Hillary Clinton, instead of deciding on the legitimacy of her husband, declares that President Bashar al-Assad is illegitimate. Just like Gaddafi. The French Prime Minister complains that China and Russia blocked the adoption of resolutions in the Security Council, that is, they wanted a similar resolution, which they will read in their own way, they are also exerting pressure, but the Libyan scenario was, as it were, sanctioned and launched, but it didn't work, didn't work for a number of reasons. After all, President Bashar al-Assad proposed much more changes than the opposition demanded. For example, the opposition demanded the eighth article of the Constitution, other articles to cancel, change, etc. And Bashar proposed a new constitution altogether. And he seems to be overplaying here. In terms of information, too, when the second stage was launched, it was supposed to lead to a split in society, and then a process of great bloodshed was to be launched. The Syrian television and media have radically changed their approach and pushed the political confrontation into the background, and brought to the fore the discussion of the future, economic processes, that is, as if the transmission of information in the usual mode, and in the background there is the opposition, and here the masses support president. That is, it did not work here either, and look that Russia and China, having burned themselves on the Libyan version of default when adopting a resolution on Libya in the Security Council, they are not going now, they are not going, despite pressure, to adopt any resolution, because, probably, finally in our world they have read second article of the UN Charter, point seven, where it is generally forbidden to discuss the domestic political events of sovereign states within the framework of the Security Council. That is, it doesn't work. But what will happen next? I warned the leadership of Syria that a series is possible. Here the Americans and their colleagues are at an impasse, and they see that they are losing, and it is no coincidence that the US ambassador and the French ambassador to Syria rushed to the city of Kana, where these oppositionists are concentrated rushed without the permission of the Syrian foreign ministry and began to publicly call on the protesters not to enter into a dialogue with the authorities, into a dialogue with society. It was already a mild panic, but here the question arises, will the Americans abandon this operation or, on the contrary, will increase their efforts, leading to great bloodshed, and then, without the sanction of the Security Council, they will be able to push the Turkish, maybe some Arab leaders. That is, you do not exclude this scenario. I do not exclude. But, frankly, since the people support the current leadership, it is hard to believe that it will be possible to impose such a forceful option. Well, the very last question, probably, is already a bridge between what is happening in Syria and what is happening in our country, in Russia. Was your trip, your negotiations somehow authorized or coordinated with the leadership of Russia? No way. That is, purely public interest. We have been cooperating with the Center for Strategic Studies of Syria and other analytical structures for a long time. And therefore, what does it mean, if they sanctioned? No, well, maybe you were appointed as an intermediary in these negotiations? Like Marjolov, no, this was unexpected for the foreign ministry, I deliberately did not even inform the foreign ministry, because in this case our ambassador to Syria would be present nearby, and there would not be that degree of confidence, there would probably be a mismatch of our positions. I was like a specialist who went through Yugoslavia, in Iraq. Your visit was informal. See Article 3 of the Constitution of the Russian Federation. I say, two presidents met, the President of the Syrian Arab Republic and the President of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems. We talked at the highest level. Leonid Grigorievich Ivashov is a guest of the No Fools program. 
Well, now to Russia, the reform of the army is going on in our country, isn't it? Where is it going? What do you think about it? Well, maybe, from the hottest point, the disruption of our defense state order. There is this disruption, no, according to your estimates, again unofficial, as far as I understand. To be honest, these army reforms have already become so disgusting to me as a military man. Well, it is necessary to reform, even Syria understands this. No, you understand, well, imagine, and let our radio listeners present. Somewhere in 1988-89, and it was then that Gorbachev launched the reform, the renovation of your apartment was launched, and it has not stopped to this day. Could you survive for so many years when everything is being reconstructed there, walls are changing, wardrobes are moving, this madhouse has been going on for so many years already? Is the end in sight? Yes, the end is visible at the end of the army, because today the armed forces as a single system do not exist. Well, they created brigades instead of divisions, no one knows where this divisional equipment, where the material resources are. They created an army for an easy fight, so that if Georgia attacks again, they will punch it in the face. But as a system of military organization, we do not exist. Do you think we have strategic opponents? In the West, in the East, overseas? We are talking about potential opponents of a strategic regional scale. They certainly are. And, you know, if you look into the history of not only ours, but also other states, as soon as a country weakens, especially militarily, in terms of resistance, confrontation, the number of opponents grows. And now we are weak. And today let's take a geopolitical look at the world. Today there are three centers of power, as we call them, three geopolitical centers, North America, Europe, and China. Each of them has its own economic models, its own currency system, but also its own armed forces, capable of projecting power to any region of the world. And today the fight is for resources, for key spaces, for anything, between these three centers of power. And everyone, here I say. Does he look with a predatory look, judging by your intonation? I suppose so. How will they develop? Well, we see that the process of developing our resources is underway, so far without a war, thank God, they are reclaiming, taking away, etc. But what will happen tomorrow? After all, look, Kissinger, and Brzezinski, and Obama have already made attempts to create G2, that is, an alliance of America and China, but an alliance against whom? And somewhere like this, God forbid, they will agree behind our backs, and these eastern expanses are for you, this is for us, and we will have absolutely nothing to object to. And today, there is nothing to object to us in the east, and in the strategic south, and in the west. Do you think that we need to develop cooperation with both of them? Or vice versa, be wary of both. No, cooperation needs to be developed. But, you understand, for the first time, probably, in the history of the Russian state, I do not take the example of tribal Rus, we were left in strategic loneliness. Today we do not have a single serious ally. And we do not fall into these spaces, the geopolitical spaces of the first level that I spoke about, and we do not build spaces of the second level. There are three of these centers of power, and today the fourth pole, the fourth geopolitical space, is extremely necessary and extremely possible. These are second-tier countries. Look, Japan, India, Brazil and Russia, we are already lagging behind these three centers of power by an order of magnitude in all respects. But today, India is also ready to build such allied relations in the economy, primarily in military affairs, etc. Today, Japan, sandwiched between China and America, is hanging squeezed by natural disasters, and it can go here, Iran is also hanging here, and so on, Brazil and so on. And this space needs to be built today. What can we give to this space? Japan, technology, India, of course, in a couple of decades, the most densely populated country in the world, but what about Russia? No, you know, Russia has a very big potential. We call it geopolitical potential. First, the experience of building both capitalism and socialism. We can offer in theoretical terms something third. Secondly, we have natural resources, look what they are. Resources, yes. In fact, we live on them. We still have the experience of creating super complex technical and social models that has not yet been completely destroyed. We have this experience, we have technologies. The fact that technologies are not going into the army today does not mean that our designers have already stopped thinking. 
They work, they bring even to the metal. They have unique products. But the state defense order is either not appointed, or it fails, and all this goes out. But it is, it is a potential, we have a huge potential. Well, then our openness, susceptibility to all the peoples of the world is also a great potential. The Chinese don't have that, and the Americans don't either. A question for you. Although I generally suspect the answer to this question. There are supporters of a large and powerful army that Russia needs, and there are supporters of a relatively small, compact, light army. As far as I understand, you belong to the first. Why does Russia need a large army? I'm not saying that the army should be large, because the army cannot be modeled in some kind of void. If we have powerful allies, because wars are planned and the response to these wars is planned. Let's take our eastern region. There should be such a massive our army. With area destruction systems, missiles, and everything else. East? Is it China? Mongolia there? Mongolia is not threatening us yet, yes. But this pressure from China, for example, we can neutralize with this powerful, active cooperation, including military technical cooperation, with India. We are balancing here, and then we need an army only for this balance. Well, of course, we need to have a mobilization resource. In the West, we do not expect the NATO troops to move their tank columns against us, etc. But it is quite possible to carry out an air operation. And so on. Therefore, here, too, it is necessary to concentrate forces of precisely this modern type. Which can repel the impact of modern air weapons. Turkey, this is the southern direction, the same thing needs to be pushed back, first of all, by political, diplomatic, economic measures. And keep the army. Because there are enough applicants for the North Caucasus and the Caspian region today. I'm not asking about strategic nuclear forces, obviously they are needed. We need aircraft carriers, they seem to be like they are in the Bosphorus Pass, they definitely won't pass through the Amormo. And along the rivers that separate us from Europe, they simply won't turn around there. Do you understand when the military is asked the question, we need aircraft carriers, we need S-300, S-400, S-500, etc. there. Then the military always has a question for politicians, what tasks will you cut for us? What political tasks will you cut for us? If you set the task that we need to ensure a powerful naval presence in the world's oceans and be ready to control or escort ships on strategic sea lanes, this is one task. If we are given the task of keeping America and China under control of our ballistic missiles, submarines, then this is a different task, therefore, until political tasks are set, it is difficult to say whether we need aircraft carrier groups. What is an aircraft carrier? This is a good powerful tool, but it requires both air defense ships and security ships, etc. Probably, in some cases this is necessary. But it's not just necessary, as we bought the Mistrals, and then they tell the sailors, you will find a use for them somewhere. And they rush about, the poor, looking for a use. So it is with an aircraft carrier. We probably need aircraft carrier groups, how many of them, I can't say, because we don't know what kind of policy and what geopolitical status we plan to have in the world. Will we interfere in African affairs? If we do, then yes. Will we confront the American squadron in the Mediterranean? If we do, then yes. So this is a question for politicians. And since we do not know today, in general, what our leadership is planning for Russia, what will be the line of foreign policy behavior, what will be the model of the economy, what will be the model of the social structure of society? We don't know anything. Therefore, just in case, the military defense keeps what they have, so that it does not become smaller. How we bought the Mistrals, and then they tell the sailors, you will find a use for them somewhere. And they rush about, the poor, looking for a use. So it is with an aircraft carrier. We probably need aircraft carrier groups, how many of them, I can't say, because we don't know what kind of policy and what geopolitical status we plan to have in the world. Will we interfere in African affairs? If we do, then yes. Will we confront the American squadron in the Mediterranean? If we do, then yes. So this is a question for politicians. And since we do not know today, in general, what our leadership is planning for Russia, what will be the line of foreign policy behavior, what will be the model of the economy, what will be the model of the social structure of society, 
we don't know anything. Therefore, just in case, the military defense keeps what they have so that it does not become smaller. How we bought the Mistrals, and then they tell the sailors, you will find a use for them somewhere. And they rush about, the poor, looking for a use. So it is with an aircraft carrier. We probably need aircraft carrier groups, how many of them, I can't say, because we don't know what kind of policy and what geopolitical status we plan to have in the world. Will we interfere in African affairs? If we do, then yes. Will we confront the American squadron in the Mediterranean? If we do, then yes. So this is a question for politicians. And since we do not know today, in general, what our leadership is planning for Russia, what will be the line of foreign policy behavior, what will be the model of the economy, what will be the model of the social structure of society? We don't know anything. Therefore, just in case, the military defense keeps what they have, so that it does not become smaller. And then they tell the sailors, you will find a use for them somewhere. And they rush about, the poor, looking for a use. So it is with an aircraft carrier. We probably need aircraft carrier groups, how many of them, I can't say, because we don't know what kind of policy and what geopolitical status we plan to have in the world. Will we interfere in African affairs? If we do, then yes. Will we confront the American squadron in the Mediterranean? If we do, then yes. So this is a question for politicians. And since we do not know today, in general, what our leadership is planning for Russia, what will be the line of foreign policy behavior, what will be the model of the economy, what will be the model of the social structure of society? We don't know anything. Therefore, just in case, the military defense keeps what they have, so that it does not become smaller. And then they tell the sailors, you will find a use for them somewhere. And they rush about, the poor, looking for a use. So it is with an aircraft carrier. We probably need aircraft carrier groups, how many of them, I can't say, because we don't know what kind of policy and what geopolitical status we plan to have in the world. Will we interfere in African affairs? If we do, then yes. Will we confront the American squadron in the Mediterranean? If we do, then yes. So this is a question for politicians. And since we do not know today, in general, what our leadership is planning for Russia, what will be the line of foreign policy behavior, what will be the model of the economy, what will be the model of the social structure of society? We don't know anything. Therefore, just in case, the military defense keeps what they have, so that it does not become smaller. And they rush about, the poor, looking for a use. So it is with an aircraft carrier. We probably need aircraft carrier groups, how many of them, I can't say, because we don't know what kind of policy and what geopolitical status we plan to have in the world. Will we interfere in African affairs? If we do, then yes. Will we confront the American squadron in the Mediterranean? If we do, then yes. So this is a question for politicians. And since we do not know today, in general, what our leadership is planning for Russia, what will be the line of foreign policy behavior, what will be the model of the economy, what will be the model of the social structure of society? We don't know anything. Therefore, just in case, the military defense keeps what they have, so that it does not become smaller. And they rush about, the poor, looking for a use. So it is with an aircraft carrier. We probably need aircraft carrier groups, how many of them, I can't say, because we don't know what kind of policy and what geopolitical status we plan to have in the world. Will we interfere in African affairs? If we do, then yes. Will we confront the American squadron in the Mediterranean? If we do, then yes. So this is a question for politicians. And since we do not know today, in general, what our leadership is planning for Russia, what will be the line of foreign policy behavior, what will be the model of the economy, what will be the model of the social structure of society? We don't know anything. Therefore, just in case, the military defense keeps what they have, so that it does not become smaller. Because we do not know what kind of politics and what geopolitical status we plan to have in the world. Will we interfere in African affairs? If we do, then yes. Will we confront the American squadron in the Mediterranean? If we do, then yes. So this is a question for politicians. 
And since we do not know today, in general, what our leadership is planning for Russia, what will be the line of foreign policy behavior, what will be the model of the economy, what will be the model of the social structure of society? We don't know anything. Therefore, just in case, the military defends, keeps what they have, so that it does not become smaller. Because we do not know what kind of politics and what geopolitical status we plan to have in the world. Will we interfere in African affairs? If we do, then yes. Will we confront the American squadron in the Mediterranean? If we do, then yes. So this is a question for politicians. And since we do not know today, in general, what our leadership is planning for Russia, what will be the line of foreign policy behavior, what will be the model of the economy, what will be the model of the social structure of society? We don't know anything. Therefore, just in case, the military defends, keeps what they have, so that it does not become smaller. So this is a question for politicians. And since we do not know today, in general, what our leadership is planning for Russia, what will be the line of foreign policy behavior, what will be the model of the economy, what will be the model of the social structure of society? We don't know anything. Therefore, just in case, the military defends, keeps what they have, so that it does not become smaller. So this is a question for politicians. And since we do not know today, in general, what our leadership is planning for Russia, what will be the line of foreign policy behavior, what will be the model of the economy, what will be the model of the social structure of society? We don't know anything. Therefore, just in case, the military defends, keeps what they have, so that it does not become smaller, on all fronts, in all directions. Let me remind you that Leonid Ivashov, President of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, is my guest today. From military problems to problems, or maybe not problems, historical. Hear you, it turns out, the heir of the Decemberist Ivashev. How did you determine, is there a family tradition or, no, my father's sister was engaged in this genealogical branch. Historical research. Yes, yes. Then my daughter joined in. All this is in our blood, as they say. That is, this is not just a family tradition, it is really confirmed by documents. Yes, Pyotr Nikolaevich Ivashev is a major general of the Kutuzov army, an engineer of the Kutuzov army. He was legendary until his son Vasily Petrovich joined the Decembrists. I did not go to the Senate. Yes, and then he was recalled from the army and headed the Military Engineering Institute in St. Petersburg. There is a booth dedicated to him, all this, yes. Subsequently, there were still military men before you, was the tradition supported? Not? You understand, in Tsarist times, our family fell out of favor with the sovereign, in Soviet times, Tsarist officers were also in disfavor. In the war, everyone was private, the most senior rank was that of the father's brother, sergeant. Is your father a veteran? Did he go through the war? Yes. And how did the car accident that happened to you affect your fate? Why did you decide to stay in the army? I saw no other meaning in life. Imagine, my childhood took place after the war, and around people in tunics, on holidays they put on medals. All conversations, even some kind of feast is going, and I was an accordion player. Accordion player or harmonica player? No, I was an accordionist, then I played the accordion, this is the highest thing I achieved there. Then, however, I also dragged around the garrisons a piano bought in Germany. Well, that's right. And now I see that the more the frontline soldiers drink, the more they increase their rank, they are already starting to say, it was our front that was the first to cross, no, ours, etc. I grew up in this environment, in fact. The whole country breathed victory and lived war. And that's why I didn't see anyone else. And when this happened, it was not something that the commission determined. The commission determined whether he was fit for non-combatant service, these are some kind of military registration and enlistment offices, logistics institutions, or for combat service. Well, I convincingly asked, persuaded the commission, let me go to continue the command line. I was the deputy commander of the regiment of the Tarman division at the time when this happened, and if it affects my health, then we will make a decision. That's how it happened. There are many amazing stories with you in life, here is one of them, how you were first a subordinate of Marshal Yazov, and then were his boss. They took him to work with you and generally went down in history partly because you are the only person who visited him in prison during the proceedings. What do you think about his role in the coup, in the events that took place in 1991? His role was secondary. 
On the first anniversary of the coup, I published the book, Marshal Yazov, The Fateful August of 1991, based on personal observations, documents, I just showed that everything seemed to be heading towards an attempt to change the being. And when local patrols of the Ministry of Internal Affairs, the armed forces, the Joint Collegium were introduced, all these were, as it were, stages of preparation for something military. And Gorbachev never made a decision. You there think, think. Here he gathers everyone and thinks. And they gathered in the same way when he left, and Yazov was not invited there first. Here he is at the ABC facility, it was only later that Kryachkov called and informed, and Yazov sent Pavel Graykev first there for a meeting, well, something seems to be planned, something is being planned, and Yazov thought that there was a serious plan, and he is included, the Minister of Defense is included in this plan, but in reality it turned out that nothing, in fact, it was not serious, it was all spontaneous. But he himself said, I got like chickens in a pluck. And so I just went to his office when they were going to fly to Foros. And he says to me, Lenya, go away, go away, I say, comrade, minister of defense, I came on official business. Don't, I'll dirty you with mud, etc. And he flew there, but I didn't see him anymore, but I visited him. Well, like, he is my commander, in some ways he is my teacher. Firstly, I headed the office of the legal service of the Ministry of Defense, I had one of the most powerful strong lawyers. They united there with lawyers Abeldiev and Pachenkin, Dmitry Timofeevich's lawyers, and jointly carried out his defense. Therefore, it was my duty, my honor, to visit the commander in a difficult situation. And so I just went to his office when they were going to fly to Foros, and he says to me, Lenya, go away, go away, I say, comrade, Minister of Defense, I came on official business. Don't, I'll dirty you with mud, etc. And he flew there, but I didn't see him anymore, but I visited him. Well, like, he is my commander, in some ways he is my teacher. Firstly, I headed the office of the legal service of the Ministry of Defense, I had one of the most powerful strong lawyers. They united there with lawyers Abeldiev and Pachenkin, Dmitry Timofeevich's lawyers, and jointly carried out his defense. Therefore, it was my duty, my honor, to visit the commander in a difficult situation. And so I just went to his office when they were going to fly to Foros. And he says to me, Lenya, go away, go away, I say, comrade, minister of defense, I came on official business. Don't, I'll dirty you with mud, etc. And he flew there, but I didn't see him anymore, but I visited him. Well, like, he is my commander, in some ways he is my teacher. Firstly, I headed the office of the legal service of the Ministry of Defense, I had one of the most powerful strong lawyers. They united there with lawyers Abeldiev and Pachenkin, Dmitry Timofeevich's lawyers, and jointly carried out his defense. Therefore, it was my duty, my honor, to visit the commander in a difficult situation. I'll stain you with mud, etc. And he flew there, but I didn't see him anymore, but I visited him. Well, like, he is my commander, in some ways he is my teacher. Firstly, I headed the office of the legal service of the Ministry of Defense, I had one of the most powerful strong lawyers. They united there with lawyers Abeldiev and Pachenkin, Dmitry Timofeevich's lawyers, and jointly carried out his defense. Therefore, it was my duty, my honor, to visit the commander in a difficult situation. I'll stain you with mud, etc. And he flew there, but I didn't see him anymore, but I visited him. Well, like, he is my commander, in some ways he is my teacher. Firstly, I headed the office of the legal service of the Ministry of Defense, I had one of the most powerful strong lawyers. They united there with lawyers Abeldiev and Pachenkin, Dmitry Timofeevich's lawyers, and jointly carried out his defense. Therefore, it was my duty, my honor, to visit the commander in a difficult situation. Leonid Ivashov is a guest of the No Fools program on Eco Moskvi, and, it seems, the last question is already on or close to it. You are known as a person, correct me if I'm wrong, rather socialist views, statist, patriotic. Are you planning to start a political career? Yes, I really am a statesman, a statesman, and you know, one should not be afraid of socialist views. First, no one knows what socialism is. Well, in Norway, they know what it is. They say, Swedish, Norwegian socialism, but it is completely different from the Soviet one. 
But we are conducting research, and you know, over the past 20 years, the popularity of liberalism in the world has fallen almost three times, from 30 to 11 percent, and the popularity of social democracy, national forms of socialism, etc., has grown by the same amount, about three times. So there is no need to be afraid of this. Well, to start a political career, to be honest, what about organizing a political party? I'm not an expert here. You are not a member, by the way, of the Communist Party. I have been a member of the CPSU for more than 30 years. I do not regret it for a second, but I have never joined another political party and will not join. And in these political processes, well, I will not create a party for sure, there is our social and military movement, and I was elected chairman of the Military Power Union, we are working as best we can. You won't go to the presidency in the 12th year? Well, now you see how difficult it is to run for president. Well, let me remind you that the guest of the No Fools program was Leonid Ivashov. Leonid Grigorievich, thank you very much for coming to this studio and answering our questions, good luck to you, all the best. All the best to our radio listeners and to you. Source, Eco Moskvi, aired on the 19th of July 2011. China sees Russia as an ally of the 21st century. China alone will not be able to withstand the fight against the United West, and the visit of Xi Jinping is an exploration of how Russia is really ready to make the Eurasian vector a priority. On March 22, Chinese President Xi Jinping will make his first international trip, he is going to visit Russia and three African states, as well as take part in the BRICC summit. The fact that he will visit Russia on his first trip abroad after being elected chairman shows that China is determined to develop Sino-Russian relations. Leonid Ivashov, president of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, told in an interview with Nakanunayu correspondent what China's desire to strengthen ties between countries is connected with. Xi Jinping is making his first foreign visit in his new post to Russia. Africa will follow. Leonid Grigorievich, how symbolic is this, what do you associate it with? China positions itself as the center of the East. Today, against the backdrop of his successes, he does not want to go to the West, understanding the essence of the West, he cooperates with the West only for reasons of pragmatism, but China has no spiritual kinship with the West and never will, like Russia, by the way. And today, China is at a turning point, last year, the People's Daily, the party's main media outlet, reported that China and Russia should forge an alliance against the West. The fact that China is now again coming up with the ideas of internationalism, and the fact that they held a plenum of the Central Committee of the Party last year, at which they discussed the issue of cultural security of the PRC, Chinese identity, this suggests that Russia today can become China's main partner not only in the economy, not only in the hydrocarbon resource sector, but also the main partner in the reconstruction of the world. And here the two vectors coincide, both the Chinese Eastern vector and the Russian Eurasian vector that Putin, Nazarbayev, Lukashenko spoke about. And so the new head of the Republic of China wants to clarify Russia's position, is Russia really leaving the Western direction and wants to find allies in the East? China's geopolitics is based on two principles, the principle of the wall is a certain autocracy, not to let into its space what is not traditional, not typical for China, that is, this Western depravity, the Western model of the financial system, liberal economy, etc. And another principle on which China's geopolitics is built is the principle of the path, to go into the world, bring your values, your goods into the world, and at the same time take everything of value that is in the world. This is manifested even today, what will be useful for the Chinese economy, for the Chinese civilization as a whole, even in the West, they will take, and they will, give away, their goods, their culture. As for Russia, yes, Russia is not following the socialist path, but those attempts by Putin to change Russia just show that Putin is ready to go for a planned economy as the basis for the development of the state. And in this we are close to China. The fact that Russia traditionally prioritizes some kind of spirituality, intellectuality, development. The integrity of society, this also coincides with Chinese approaches. Therefore, visiting Xi Jinping will be an exploration of how Russia is really ready to carry out its development, making the Eurasian vector, the Asian vector, a priority. If we get a serious conversation with Putin, then we can already develop the Shanghai Cooperation Organization into a large Eurasian Union of Civilizations. And as for the customs union, in this regard, China is not worried that its creation will limit the opportunities for the export of Chinese goods, 
Now, if we form the Eurasian Union on the basis of the SCO, then we will no longer enter the space of the new continental bloc independently, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Kazakhstan, but we will be one organized core. This should not scare China, because we are part of a single entity. Are there contradictions today between Russia and China which are manifested within the SCO? There are no fundamental contradictions. China is waiting for Russia to stop imposing on its country and the post-Soviet space the Western system of values, the priority of the Western direction. China is particularly interested in our resources here, so that they do not flow to Europe, but turn to the East. We have coinciding plans for the development of the Arctic, the Northern Sea Route, and we need to offer this to China, India, and other countries of the East. There are no fundamental contradictions, if Russia chooses its traditional Eurasian path of development, then together with China, within the framework of the new union, it is possible to create a new economic model that is different from the model of the West. What else China sees positively in cooperation with Russia is that Russia never prioritizes any internal political issues of a partner country, as the West does, either their human rights are violated in China, or there the yuan is not devalued. Russia does not get involved in such matters, which means that it is a more profitable long-term partner for China. You could say the West is on the alert. Do you think that Western countries mistakenly believe that China, having become richer and more powerful, is now too self-confident? This self-confidence was present in them before. But earlier, the high rates of economic development formed a whole layer of Chinese businessmen and politicians who saw their prospects in the West, made calls for rapprochement with the West, for almost allied relations with the West. Today, China is disappointed in this, China feels that the West is waging a powerful war against China's development, the Chinese are well aware that a strike on Libya, a strike on Syria, on Iran is an arrow launched towards China. It is being squeezed out of this zone, they are trying to limit its influence, they are being squeezed out of the African continent, today we see such latent battles against China's expansion into the Latin American continent, the Americans are increasing their presence in the Strait of Malacca, in the South China Sea. Now Bush's announcement of a proposal to create a single transatlantic trade zone between North America and Europe is the creation of a powerful economy to counter the Chinese economy, they are trying to do the same in the Pacific zone. The Chinese understand that in the fight against the United West, not only states, but also large world finances, it will not cope alone, it needs long-term allies, and China sees Russia, an ally of the 21st century, as its main ally. You said that China is being squeezed out from the zone of possible influence, but do you think that China has a definite plan of action in the region after the withdrawal of US troops from Afghanistan? China, of course, has some options, but still it cannot cope alone. On the one hand, it is a powerful country with a dynamically developing economy, with a huge GDP, but on the other hand, China today has many weaknesses, including overpopulation, lack of resources, and it is getting worse every year, so China will now, under a new leader, actively form a China-centric Asia so that the countries of the Asia-Pacific region are in alliance with China. China has serious positions for this, Chinese diasporas in these countries, despite their small number, dominate at least in the economy, which means they can also influence politics. But Russia does not need to go, under China, Russia needs to build its own configuration of forces. The same Iran, we need to radically change our attitude towards Iran, India, for example, should be our main economic and political partner, and in this space a balance of forces, a balance of interests is being built, this will allow us to survive, at least. Today we are twitching between East and West, resulting in pressure from both East and West. Will the United States in every possible way prevent China from creating a China-centric Asia? What are your predictions regarding the US position in Central Asia? This is their old dream, to control Eurasia is not possible through Russia, because now she snorts and wants independence, the Americans are starting to work hard in the Central Asian region, they are trying to tear other countries away from Russia. With Uzbekistan, they succeed, the second is to quarrel so that the countries live, like the Arab East, in a state of conflict, then it is easier to manage them one by one, because the United States will provoke revolutions. What about China's close neighbors, Japan? The Japanese premier accuses China of building its patriotism on anti-Japanese sentiments, that China's open economy is pushing it to the sea and making Beijing aggressive. Should we expect deterioration of the already not very friendly relations between neighbors? In fact, Japan is starting to look for ways to get closer to China, which is not bad in general. 
The Japanese are well aware that America abandoned Japan. Sometime after the Second World War it pulled Japan, but today Japan is a big economic competitor for the United States. Japan has strong influence in the Asia-Pacific zone, and the Americans are trying to dominate there. The Chinese today, from an economic point of view, need to maintain the enemy syndrome in society. They have too close economic ties with the Americans. They act cautiously in this regard, but to draw the image of the enemy from Japan is important for patriotism. There will be a certain transformation of the Communist Party itself. The Communist ideology, which is underway, but still slowly, will acquire a traditional Confucian character. And on the other hand, quarreling with Japan, the Japanese and Chinese will implicitly look for such prospects for their joint survival that Russia will have the opportunity to be a kind of arbiter. Do not forget that the Japanese live in constant fear of extinction, there will be several more tsunamis like the last one, and the existence of Japan as a state will be in question. Do you think that China can lose Japanese and other foreign investments if it continues its aggressive policy? What does the Japanese Prime Minister scare China with? Yes, China is not afraid of the loss of investment. China has a huge gold and foreign exchange reserve, they have powerful state planning, plus huge exports from China. The only thing that scares Chinese economists is the possibility of a recession in general, what is happening in America. Then the Chinese factory will produce a surplus of goods that cannot go to other markets. And investments, especially industrial investments, are not the main thing for China now, they try to put the surplus of their products on the domestic market, but they won't be able to go there because they need currency. But now, in addition to the obstacles that the West is building for China, there are also accusations of cyber espionage. How do you assess the relationship between America and China in this regard? Is there a threat of cyber war? You understand, when the Americans come up with something like that for other countries or for the whole of humanity, they first launch an information psychological attack, as it was in Yugoslavia. The fact that they seem to feel sorry for the Albanians, they invaded there, they felt sorry for the Shiites, they destroyed the state of Iraq, then destroyed Libya, for this they invent everything. After all, today a cyber command has been created in the Pentagon, where the staffing level is simply crazy, 4,000, and most of the cyber command units are classified. Secret people, secret actions, that is, the Americans are launching this war, in order to justify their activities, they need to find some kind of mythical threat. The cyber war is going on, and this must be admitted, it was the Americans who organized and launched it, but now we need to find a scapegoat. This is where China needs to unite with Russia. By the way, according to our data, there are about 15 Russian young guys working in the Pentagon, but this is only according to verified data, most likely, there are many more of them there. The Chinese also work there, they seek out such people, take them away, classify them, and they work. It must be said that Russian youth now have much more potential for these cyber wars than even the Chinese. Therefore, here some kind of agreement on counteracting cyber attacks is necessary, it is necessary to unite efforts, we cannot resist the United West alone in such areas. We need to unite for our own safety. Source, Nakanoon.ri, the 22nd of March 2013. While the guns are silent. Most countries in the world are actively reducing military spending. These are the conclusions of the Stockholm Institute for Peace Research. A serious decrease in costs was recorded in the USA, Canada, Australia, Japan and a number of European countries. The only exceptions are China and Russia. Our country's spending on new missiles increased by $165 over the year and exceeded $12 billion. However, they do not compete at all and are not comparable with the US military budget, which for a long time reached more than $600 billion. Russia is now only catching up. Over the past 20 years, the country has demilitarized because the military ideology, the ideology of defense and security was based on the idea that we have no enemy. Later, however, it was still corrected, saying that the enemy is terrorism. But, as we all understand, missiles are not needed to fight it, and many tanks are not required. And today it suddenly turned out that Russia has plenty of enemies. And not just adversaries who are fighting us in other regions of the world or are just planning, but those who aim their political strategy, military groups, and new types of weapons against us. And now we have come to our senses and are allocating large, by our standards, funds in order to at least make up for something. A number of countries are indeed now reducing military spending. 
but not because they decided to sing a peace and friendship between peoples. There are a number of completely different reasons here. First, it is a crisis of the entire pseudo-liberal democratic system and capitalism, as a result of which these states have to save. Secondly, today spending on armaments is already becoming unpopular, there are other ways of conducting military operations that correspond to new types of weapons. For example, the Americans have created powerful cyber commands in the Pentagon. 4,000 highly qualified specialists are developing a system of information and psychological warfare, chips are allocated for them, etc. The West understands that it is possible to achieve the same goals, but at a lower cost. And we need to think about this too. Yes, today we need tanks, weapons, and armored vehicles, but first of all, we need to gather our most powerful designers, researchers, scientists, etc. We have much more talented people than in Europe or America. But their all scientific intellect and power are concentrated, while in our country all this is blurred. And as a result, there are far fewer truly talented and smart people in government structures in Russia. All of them are walking all over the Russian space. In general, Defense Minister Sergei Shugu inherited Trishkin's kaftan, where there are only thieves' holes and everything is in the stage of a deep lag. If other countries did not destroy their military industrial complex, the network of fundamental and applied research, then we destroyed it all, transferred it to warehouses, terminals, and also into private hands. And today, only separate islands of a large military industrial potential have been preserved. Here we also need to restore the defense industry as a system in which fundamental and applied research is carried out, various developments of military systems are being carried out, etc., but all this requires time, effort, huge costs and will. Of course, the private sector must be present in the defense industry system, but not as the main participant. Only the state is responsible for defense, security, sets a common strategic line. It also attracts both state research structures and private structures on certain issues, but only within the framework of its own projects. And it is impossible to simply give the defense industry at the mercy of private individuals. Today there is an opinion, by the way, it was recently voiced by the chairman of the State Duma Committee on Defense Franz Klintsevich, that if Russia did not possess nuclear weapons, then neighboring countries experiencing big problems would have long ago begun to tear it apart. However, at present, such a term as the preemptive war that the United States is now waging with us in the Middle East has been introduced into circulation. In these types of wars, the West is tasked with conquering all countries without bombing or invading by military forces. Let's look at Russia. Well, aren't we a conquered country? We ourselves took it and gave up, we tied our economy, finances, etc. to Western systems and let the threads through which we are controlled grow. The main object in these so-called non-contact wars is the elite. This is done in order to bring to power what we now have, starting with Gorbachev, without military action, which is costly even for the United States, and to continue to control and milk this country, without attacking or destroying it. The principle here is simple, put on a muzzle and drive. And this applies not only to our country. We see that as a result of revolutions, the Arab Spring, etc. Other countries are conquered, and this is declared the triumph of democracy. In general, there are surprising points in the 2006 US national security strategy. The first of these is to overthrow democratic regimes, and the second is to build a new nation. Here in this set of measures to change the national identity of the people, tanks are also not required. This example is very typical for Russia, we have anti-culture, pseudo-elections, and much more. We stopped being Russians and imitated some Western values and standards. Therefore, I rather disagree with Franz Klintsevich that Russia, thanks to nuclear weapons, is an independent power. No, we have not been such a country for a long time. But the tanks and guns are still silent. Source, Max Park, the 17th of April 2013. Syrian Mission of Russia Russia is obliged to support Syria and form a system of collective defense. If we lose Syria now, they will spit on us everywhere. Says the former head of the main directorate of international military cooperation of the Russian Ministry of Defense, Colonel General of the Reserve Leonid Ivashov. He spoke about this in an interview with a Piravda.au correspondent. Leonid Grigorievich, the most pressing question right now is, will the United States launch a missile attack on Syria, 
What is happening today around Syria is nothing but the revival and legitimization of fascism in the West. The West has always brought the greatest misfortunes to mankind, the Crusades, and Napoleon, and the First, Second World Wars. Today we see that the ideological base for the Western elite has become not some kind of humanistic, messianic goals. In the ideological sphere, a certain explosive mixture of perverted liberalism, fascism and homosexuality has formed. These are crazy people, but, unfortunately, they rule in their countries today and determine the policy. And this explosive mixture is spreading all over the world. The Americans launched this operation against Syria two years ago, and we have been following it closely. To date, they have not been able to break the Syrian regime, the Syrian people, and then they fall into a deadlock. And what countries are the most faithful allies of the Americans in this matter? They have no allies, they only have satellites that have forked out, especially Saudi Arabia and Qatar, to form bands of mercenaries. And today, they see that Bashar al-Assad survived, which means that all their efforts and their political capital are turning into a soap bubble. For the Americans, this is not only a loss of face, but also the loss of a system for managing their own community of satellites. It is clear that they want to prove their strength, their power, their leadership in this Western gangster world community, and therefore, in Syria, they are ready to do anything, to a great lie, which they are doing in order to prove their strength, their power, and to prove to their satellites and other countries, including Russia, that the Americans must be obeyed in everything. For their interests, for their huge profits, we must obey. This is the logic they have laid down today and cannot abandon it, because the United States, like the West, is ruled not by real politicians, not by representatives of the people, but by this huge financial capital. And for the sake of their profits, Marx also said about this, they will go to any crimes. Here they go to these crimes. Does this mean that aggression against Syria and its defeat is inevitable? I do not think so. Today we are witnessing that the world is beginning to change dramatically. It is in such a transitory, transitional state, but it is moving from the worst, western-centric, world to the better. And the beginning of this world is visible. And while Russia is trading, it is showing its independence. Putin announced the formation of the Eurasian Union. We see that the Chinese are ready to transform the Shanghai Cooperation Organization into a powerful transcontinental Eurasian bloc. We see the BRICS countries, this is a large part of the human population also wants a new world and is already laying bricks in its building. Clearly, Americans are afraid of this. And this force, it is not used today, Russia, for example. After World War II, humanity entrusted Russia with the most important function of maintaining international peace, it elected Russia a permanent member of the Security Council. And this is not only an honorable duty or a debt of memory to our fallen soldiers. This is a high responsibility for maintaining international peace. In such a situation, Russia is obliged to demand an urgent convening of the UN Security Council and submit a resolution condemning the preparation for aggression and forbidding it. Russia's second duty is to provide support for Syria's individual or collective defense. This is not just a right, it is an obligation, we are obliged to support both individually and form a system of collective defense. We didn't do that either. The BRICS heads of state adopted a resolution on Syria in Durban this year. Unanimously. Five states. But why don't even the ministers of foreign affairs gather today to show that it's not you, the international community, but us? And we declare on behalf of the three billion people of the planet, we are against it. But this is not being done, in the light of recent events and the general situation in the Middle East and Transcaucasia. Perhaps it would be advisable to organize the supply of Russian weapons to Iran. You understand, to supply weapons to Iran today, there are no problems. What are the problems of transporting weapons to an Iranian port? Problems are created, in my opinion, by orders from Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv does not want us to deliver to Iran, does not want us to deliver to Syria, but here they simply take it under the hood and answer, yes. That's all. Our military technical cooperation with these countries is fully controlled from Tel Aviv. Ariel Sharon said this when he was Minister of Defense. Then, in my opinion, somewhere in the late 90s, he came as an inspector, figured out who, what, whom you are teaching, and so on. Therefore, it must be admitted that it would be better then to open a branch of the Israeli Ministry of Defense or the Ministry of Trade and announce that that's it. 
We, our authorities, are still playing with roots, there are some difficulties. Two sovereign states. In Soviet times, they always made sure that the balance of power in this or that region was not disturbed, because the balance of power is a guarantee of security for both countries. But Tel Aviv today surpasses Iran in almost all military technical parameters. In order to avoid a war, it is necessary to supply appropriate weapons to Iran. This is our interest. Thus, we will move the threat away from the Caspian, we will move the threat away from our borders, we will move millions of refugees to our country, and so on. But you see, for some reason our national interests are not in the foreground. Moreover, I will tell you that what I am about to find out, to be honest, is not only outrageous, I want some kind of repression against those who, in fact, are doing this. Leonid Grigorievich, what do you mean? Look, today, in fact, the famous MiG company will be on the verge of bankruptcy, because through corruption schemes, Mr. Pogosian is pushing Sukhoi planes everywhere. Worldwide, the ratio of light to heavy fighters is 70 thirtieths in favor of light fighters. Today, light fighters and production and development are generally covered up. We push only the heavy ones. There will be no one to cover the infantry and conquer the airspace. I was at the International Nuclear Center in Dubna. You understand, they let me in, it is international. There the Americans dominate today. We cannot carry out any projects for the Ministry of Defense, not only nuclear, but also conventional weapons, without the permission of this international community. Well, what is this going on? The Ministry of Defense cannot conclude a contract. I visited a surprisingly interesting enterprise, the State Research Institute of Chemistry and Technology of Organoelement Compounds. You know, I saw miracles there. And including, in the defense sector, they create both composite materials and technologies, and already, let's be frank, defense products of the second half of the 21st century. An American firm is approaching to cooperate with them. Naturally, closed topics, refuse. Appealed by another company, on the other hand they come in, they refuse. What are our Russian technologies doing then? They remove the director, declare that all enterprises of Russian technologies should make a profit, and today they are already walking around that it is necessary to build a shopping center on the basis of this non-profit institution, tomorrow there will be a profit. Is this not a crime? This is treason to the motherland, there is no other way to call it. And those who do this still hope to escape punishment, to hide somewhere in the West. Firstly, let them look at all these defectors, they will extradite them, find them and put them up against the wall for these deeds. Of this I am convinced. And not in some century, it will be in this decade. Therefore, it is difficult to talk about defense and security today. On the one hand, there was hope that Sergei Kuz Hugitovich Shugu would come and restore order. And he began, but we see how obstacles are being placed everywhere today. The Ministry of Finance does not finance those contracts that the Ministry of Defense was ready to conclude, for example, with MiG. This enterprise, which works for the defense industry, for our military space industry, for the same Balava, for our ship fleet, works quite successfully, the Ministry of Defense is not able to protect, and there is no one else. There is no one in our country to protect, everything is bought, everything is sold. Therefore, I would like to hope that at least Syria will not be surrendered, the last ally in the East. In your opinion, why did the Americans ignore the MAKS 2013 air show? As for the non-participation of Americans in the cabin, you understand, the Americans did not fly here for technology, there are practically no new ones left. They just flew here, demonstrating friendly relations between Bush Putin, Obama Medvedev, and so on. Today, our relations have become a little cool. We will say, they have ceased to yield to them in everything, so they showed us a figure. They don't want to. How can you organize these salons without developing your own aircraft industry, destroying it step by step? In general, our government is very interesting. I look, both the president and the government do not demonstrate the success of the country's development, but every day they are promoting themselves to the population. Nothing to brag about. And so it remains only to stick out yourself. Here are their policies. Source, Military Review, the 9th of June 2013. About global arsonists and Serdyukov. N. Miniva, friends, for 30 p.m. in the Russian capital. 
Natalia Mineva at the microphone. Our guest today is the president of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, Colonel General Leonid Ivashov. Leonid Grigorievich, hello. L. Ivashov, hello. I have two topics for you. These are the Ministry of Defense, its former minister, Mr. Serdyukov, against whom they refused to initiate a criminal case, and the situation in Egypt. Events are also developing very interestingly there. Mubarak could be released from prison literally this week. This raises a lot of questions. Where did you want to start? Let's go from Egypt, maybe. Let's go from Egypt, really. Former Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak, who is on trial, in particular, on charges of killing hundreds of people as a result of a protest in 2011, could actually be released from prison this week, because the court overturned the charge under one article, namely for participation in corruption scams. What does it mean if Mubarak really goes free? What? The whole revolution is fucked up and therefore now Egypt is returning to where it started its Arab Spring. You know, even if Mubarak is released from prison, he will not affect the political process. And, of course, he will not participate. The events there are, firstly, multifaceted. And they are in the nature of a clash of global forces. After all, let's see who the Muslim Brotherhood are. Islamists. Islamists, yes. But where was the headquarters of the Muslim Brotherhood all these years after the ban? She was in London. And she was under the patronage of the British Secret Services. Of course, the Americans used them, etc. Everyone, in short, whoever benefits from it, used them. What is the benefit? Firstly, the formula that guides British policy in the Middle East was formulated back in the early 30s of the last century by Lawrence Averisky, a resident of British intelligence. He said, our task, the task of Britain, is to make the Arabs fight against the Arabs for our interests. Today, the main interests of the West are concentrated there, and not only oil ones. And here is what is happening today, you understand, on the one hand, the West, which contributed to the coming of its agents in the person of the Muslim Brotherhood to power in Egypt. That is, excuse me, I just want to clarify, because when the Arab Spring in Egypt was just beginning, many experts said that the West did not need this mess in the Middle East and North Africa so much that this was probably an internal matter and this is absolutely the rebellion that has been brewing in the souls of the Egyptians for 84 years. Suppose today the picture is changing dramatically, or what? Has the West really brought the Muslim Brotherhood to power? You understand, each operation contains, as always, a preliminary stage, this is the legend of the operation, that is, disinformation, disguise, etc. This, of course, was, because it was the British who released this genie with the consent of the Americans, then I'm disappointed in them. They couldn't. They let you out, but they couldn't keep it. Not. Everything is going well here. They released in order to cause this confrontation. But look who is against the Muslim Brotherhood today. The Americans, therefore, refused to provide financial support to the new government, the interim government, what they had done before, etc. And, it would seem, this could crush the military a little, squeeze it. But today, all expenses, even more than that, compensate for American loans, finance American aid and aid from the West to Saudi Arabia. Why do they do this in Egypt and differently in Syria? Because the Muslim Brotherhood will not be limited to Egypt, Syria, etc. The Saudi Kingdom expects the government, at least it expects the same processes to be launched in Saudi Arabia. Also by the hands of the West? By the hands of the West, of course. So that the whole Arab world? This is one axis, the West and the Arab world. And the fact that Saudi Arabia is working today, Recognizing this government, supporting it, etc. is the opposition of part of the Arab world to the West. But there is another. It is very interesting that Saudi Arabia suddenly stood up and began to resist the West. Well, the head of Saudi intelligence came to Russia, met with President Putin and no one else. It's about something. And it was the Egyptian problem, as I understand it, that stood at the head. So that Russia does not take the side of the Muslim Brotherhood. But there is another axis of opposition. Look, Turkey, it would seem, is a Muslim, secular country, and suddenly it takes the side of the Muslim Brotherhood. And why is it surprising if half of the Turkish government is in this organization? Well, I mean, it doesn't surprise me, yes. 
We are talking to our wide audience, it would seem that this is Turkey. We understand that it is under the powerful influence of the United States and Britain and Europe as a whole. It has not yet got rid of the illusion of being able to join the European Union. Business is tied to Europe, etc. But here, we are looking today, there is a second axis of confrontation, Sunnis, Shiites. It is very acute in Syria. And now Turkey, Erdogan, the leadership found itself in such a situation, in Turkey to support the Muslim Brotherhood, and here to reject it, to expose itself to the influence of the same Muslim Brotherhood. I am sorry. Now let's go to advertising and we will certainly return to this topic. President of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, Colonel General Leonid Ivashov in the RSN studio. Advertising and we will continue. President of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, Colonel General Leonid Ivashov is in the RSN studio. We continue. Edo Advertising Leonid Grigorievich said the following, that Turkey was in a certain vice. Because from the side of Syria, it kind of needs to support the Muslim Brotherhood, and on the other hand, it needs to support the West, because it directly depends on the West, and, as you said yourself, despite Erdogan's statements, it has not lost the illusion of entry into the European Union. Why then, if Turkey found itself in such a terrible grip, is the brightest fire now taking place, burning precisely in Egypt, North Africa? In Turkey, it was possible to extinguish the popular unrest, protest unrest, etc., which were a little earlier. As they say, thank God, all this did not overflow into a tougher confrontation. And you want to say that it was not at all in this Tezi Park, but it was the beginning of what is happening in Egypt now. Here I would like to tell our radio listeners, do you understand why there are special services, why there is a network of non-governmental organizations funded by the states? All this exists in order to work abroad, to work secretly, in a shadow way, in favor of their own interests, the interests of the state to which they belong. And in Turkey, look what Erdogan's policy has led to. The first is Iran, Syria, China, and somewhere, probably, the Russian special services on the Syrian issue, they had to act against Syria, against politics, to soften. This time. On the other hand, the same, Muslim Brotherhood, the same Kurds and many more ethnic groups who do not like the current policy of Turkey. You need to understand that Russian and Western, in particular German, researchers write that in Turkey there are only 37% of native Turks. And this wrong, especially selfish national Turkish policy immediately puts other ethnic groups in tension. It must be used by the secret services there. So someone really helped. But a protest against this inconsistent policy of Erdogan has matured in Turkey, but it has been extinguished. How can you blame Erdogan for the inconsistency of his policies, if he should be scattered just like an atom constantly dividing into parts? You yourself say that this is his forced position. Do you understand how inconsistency manifests itself? Well, let's take the Middle East, Turkey's attitude. Erdogan, in general, we will say that the Turkish government, after the attack by Iraq, the destruction of the Iraqi state and the strengthening of Kurdish autonomy, in fact, concludes allied relations between Syria, Turkey and Iran. And this policy was quite strong. It seems that there are claims to the role of leader in the Islamic world and the Middle East, and this policy, which, as it were, united the population. It was anti-American, anti-Israeli, etc. Then Erdogan suddenly turns around. Syria and Iran, of course. It builds hostile relations on the territory of Turkey, combat detachments begin to form and go to Syria, etc. Of course, this was not necessary for the majority of the population. Look, in relation to Russia, they hug our presidents, sign agreements, economic, transport, then they suddenly land our plane, etc. Turkey is not particularly perceived in Europe. And as a result, Erdogan led to the fact that Turkey has no allies today not only military, but also political. And this is his weakness, in fact, about allies if we started talking. If the West is so actively operating there and everything is done by the hands of the West in order to arrange this chaos, which of the allies remained with Egypt and whom should the interim government of Egypt rely on? If I understand correctly, the situation there is like this, there were no elections, no Morsi, there was a military junta for decades, in fact, the Egyptian army rules the show in Egypt. Well, you know, it may be Egypt's happiness that the military is popular there, that the military is keeping the situation under control. 
But you say who are the allies of Egypt? Today, the current real government, the military and the interim government have a growing number of allies. First, despite the fact that relations will be tense between Syria and Egypt, Morsi has declared, in fact, a jihad against the Syrian leadership, the military is reserved. Secondly, I say, look at Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the Persian Gulf countries are not Shiite, in fact, today the Middle East is sunny, today it is on the side of the Egyptian military. And this is a fairly large financial power and armed power, etc. So there are allies. Further, these relations, I believe, will intensify. And we'll see. Who plus who? Consolidate in what mass? Let's talk about regimes. Well, of course, a significant part of the people, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, Jordan, Egypt, etc. This consolidation will be red asks the fifth, our listener, who plays all the same, the first violin of the events in Egypt, the Democrats or the Republicans of the USA. It seems that before Obama, Egypt was always the domain of the Republicans, and they provided much more assistance to Egypt. You know, to be honest, I do not believe in, so to speak, fundamental differences between the policies of the Republicans and Democrats. You know, America can be envied not in terms of actions, but in terms of strategy. They have ideas, world domination, world domination. And here they diverge only like Kissinger and Brzezinski, for example. Brzezinski, global leadership, Kissinger, global domination. But the essence is the same, to be the first on the planet, to manage planetary processes. But Obama's ideology, in my opinion, is very different from this ideology of world domination. Secondly, the political strategy is the same. Here are the nuances already in tactics. Some saber rattling more there, saying tougher phrases, like George W. Bush, for example, and this is typical of the Republicans. Democrats use soft power. Which one is more effective is hard to say. At one stage, they entered as an enemy, the military forces worked, but then they stopped working, especially in Afghanistan. And here the Democrats use softer methods, but achieve, if not greater, then at least the same results. Therefore, Little depends on American presidents. There is an established elite, an established consensus. They can argue about internal issues, about something else, but there is no difference here regarding the leadership or hegemony of the United States and the main strategy that this strategy should be offensive. Friends, Colonel General Leonid Ivashov, president of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, is in the studio of the Russian News Service. We will break for a short commercial and continue. Friends, Colonel General Leonid Ivashov, President of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, is in the studio of the Russian News Service. As far as I understand from what Leonid Grigorievich said, we were all in error for a very long time. Because at first, they tried to convince us all that the West has nothing to do with the Arab Spring that is sweeping across the Arab world. Now, based on your words, only the West and only the West has anything to do with this. The question is, are you saying that for now the US continues to support the Muslim Brotherhood? Oh sure. But then why is Mercy extending and extending the arrest? The Egyptian army successfully suppresses the protests of supporters of President Morsi. How can this happen? This is where the anti-American policy in the Middle East is read. I have already said that the oil-rich and generally money-rich countries of the Middle East today are clearly on the side of the Egyptian military. At what point and because of what did the change in orientation of this vegetative system of the Middle East occur? Well, at what point? It's hard to say. Here is the Arab Spring, somewhere. You understand, it's like in an electric field, tension grows, grows, then a spark, and the whole field started working, that's what happened there. But the Americans calmly agreed to hand over Hosni Mubarak, who was, in fact, their ally for many years, more than 30 years. They hand it over and start this process, release the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is not some kind of sect, you need to understand here, closed, closed. And it did not arise yesterday. And it did not arise yesterday, yes. Since the 30s of the last century, it has been artificially created by British intelligence, etc. They have a large network of their banks. They have holdings of enterprises, etc. And interestingly, they had their own combat organizations. And they, that is, armed, 
in fact, formations, were not brought into the category of terrorists. The moment has come when it was necessary to release them. They were released. For what? Here is the same principle, so that the Arabs, Putin's word, drenched, Arabs, Sunnis, Shiites, etc. And this huge arc of instability which starts from Tunisia and runs through the entire Middle East. The Middle East, through Afghanistan, Pakistan and goes to China, it is pressing both Russia and China, etc., in circles. You said, Russia is running out. One of our listeners just, speaking about Russia, asks, if anything, just in case, who is Russia's ally now, Syria, Venezuela, North Korea. Nikolai, our listener, is worried, not. You understand, Russia today has allies, I would say, 70% of the countries of the world. But not today's Russia, not Russia's current policy, when we are sitting on two chairs, playing along with the West, etc. You understand that if Russia pursued its traditional foreign policy, a policy of justice, policy of preventing wars, and observed the norms of international law, you you know, Latin America would be ours, not only Venezuela. And now she's not ours? She is ours, but you understand, this is passive while support is coming. She is ours. Africa, most countries would be on our side. China, India, and generally the southeastern part. So China, India are members of the BRICS, they are, of course, ours. BRICS members, of course, yes. But, in BRICS, by the way, as in the SCO, there is no one leader. And so Russia had to actively propose a general project for the reorganization of the world. This world is already falling apart. Yes. Do you understand? And if we were to act actively, look, we are handing over Libya, for example, we are allowing it to be destroyed, it seems that they have undertaken to support Syria, etc. We are behaving completely inconsistently. But this is our direct, clear, traditional policy against violence, against injustice, against interference in internal affairs, we would have found the whole world as an ally, but today this halo is worn by the United States. At least it is declared that this is the only country in the world that is for justice, for equality, for democracy, for non-intervention. Who gave this status to the Americans, to themselves, and this status? So they imposed this idea on everyone else, they imposed an idea on everyone. But you see, I worked in Europe and in NATO, etc. You see, I would not say that there is at least one such close ally of the United States in Europe. And so I confess, when I harshly criticized there and once at the Russian NATO Council imprisoned an American minister, when he insolently pressed buttons, interrupted everyone, etc., I don't remember which minister of NATO countries would not come up and silently shook my hand. And the British were so proud. Well, one of my colleagues, the general, says, for the first time since the creation of NATO, you shut the mouth of the arrogant Americans. So Europe is uniting into the European Union, there was an attempt to create military political structures, not to protect against Russia, from someone, they want to get away from the Americans. Do they still want to get away from the Americans? They want to leave. On the one hand, they are so economically and financially interconnected that it is scary to break them apart. Agree, even if Europe creates some kind of its own military political association, these forces will still be in no way comparable to the power of the United States, even if they are left alone. Why does Europe need NATO, such a powerful force? Negotiate with Russia, Russia is open. And we were the first to propose, even under Stalin, to create a system. Tell it to the Baltics, tell it to Poland, tell it to the Finns. You know, recently I literally had a meeting with the Latvians. Ordinary Latvians, teachers, etc. And a Serbian friend, we met in Montenegro, asks the question, did you live better in the Soviet Union or in the European Union? You know, a businessman said, if there were no repressions, it would be better in the Soviet Union. And the woman frankly, yes, the Soviet Union. We have evolved, today you are dying out. Obviously everything. Friends, Colonel General Leonid Ivashov, President of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, is in the studio of the Russian News Service. Ahead of the information release, and we will continue. Friends, Colonel General Leonid Ivashov, President of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, is in the studio of the Russian News Service. Here is the urgent news, by the way, in the topic of our conversation, 
the Egyptian court decided to release the country's ex-president Hosni Mubarak. Maybe they listen to the Russian news service? I'm just trying to move smoothly from one topic to another. Namely, to the former Minister of Defense of the Russian Federation Anatoly Serdyukov. A huge wave, I won't even say how powerful a wave of indignation, at least among our listeners of the RSN, was caused by the fact that the main investigative department of the investigative committee refused to initiate a criminal case, the defendants of which could be ex-Minister of Defense Serdyukov and the former Ekaterina Priyazheva, director of the education department of the military department. But I think that these surnames play a somewhat secondary role. Here the flagship Serdyukov, of course. What's going on? Why? So, I don't even agree that Serdyukov played the main role here. There were some forces that forced Putin to appoint this furniture store manager, this a priory swindler, to the post of Minister of Defense. Tell me, could a reasonable person simply, if he wants to strengthen the army, military technical development of the armed forces, etc., appoint such a person? Do you understand what the story is? I cannot in any way reproach Putin for even a bit of short-sightedness. This is one, but two, that someone could force him. I spoke with Vladimir Vladimirovich on this topic, when Serdyukov was still at the post of minister. And he, leaving the presidency, takes and appoints this person. So there must have been some sort of trade. He said, I did not know him, did not see him, etc. That is, some forces forced him. Some forces, of course, are liberal. Liberal forces. Those who, through the mouth of Jürgens, for example, and he, on behalf of Medvedev, stated that the goal was to integrate into another civilization, join NATO, etc. These are the forces that were dragged so that we were under the NATO umbrella. Now, when Putin came, figured it out, and, as he promised us officers, he took it off. But the strength remains. When did he promise you this? Discover this secret. I'll open it. It was January 2012. It's not that long ago. I understand. He promised when they told him everything that was going on in the army, in my opinion, he did not know much. But the forces remained, and the goal of lowering the level of defense capability remained. And today, we see how Putin allocates money, and Rogo's in fights to rearm the army. There is no need to fight with old tanks. And Sergei Kuzhugitovich Shugu is taking measures to ensure that the army is built on a new, scientific, modern basis. But we immediately see that another process is starting. The process of killing enterprises and institutions, design bureaus that are developing the latest models, the latest types of armed equipment, protection, etc. This is now a wave. The question still arises. What should be the price of the issue, if in trade Putin is suddenly inferior to the representatives of the liberal wing in order to allow this ruinous reform of the military department in general, in order to return later and redo everything again? In my opinion, before the events in Libya, Putin still had some illusions that there would be no war with the West, friendship, we help them with everything we can, give our resources, reduce the army, there will be peace and order. But this missile defense system makes it clear that the task is to neutralize our nuclear missile potential. What are we left with then? In the conventional armed forces, we are no competitors today. The second is the destruction of Libya, the crucifixion of Gaddafi, etc. And all the resources, and not only Gaddafi, but the entire gold and foreign exchange reserve of Libya, were taken away, they said it was the dictator's money, embezzled, etc. And this made Putin think. And he does change policy to lean on his army. Big money is allocated there, etc. You are telling some phantasmagoric things. Because Putin never seemed to me a naive person, capable of believing someone from the West that there will be no war, and really suddenly start disarming, just every day, every day, we take off our coats. Well, how? But why? Putin, in fact, was at the helm for 12 years, when even Medvedev was president. Why did we disarm? Why? Why did they sign an agreement in 2007 that NATO would come here, it is valid, it has the form of a law, it will enter without any border control, customs, etc. What is the Ulyanovsk NATO base? Put an end to it, after all, is this really a NATO base? Or, as promised, a transit point for the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan?
When I listen to political scientists, deputies, who will there be napkins, etc., I immediately take the position of military terminology. The military organization is clearly structured, you see, there is a battalion, there is a brigade. And this base is an operational rear base. Otherwise, no. This is a base with its own tasks, etc. Unfortunately, time is running out. The question is, yes and no. Sergei Yukov is on trial, tried for treason, undermining the defense of the state and, of course, for fraud. Thank you for coming and answering questions. Friends, during these 40 minutes the president of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, Colonel General Leonid Ivashov, was in the studio of the Russian News Service. Source, Russian News Service, the 21st of August 2013. Beginning of America's Decline. On October 16th, the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, AGP, together with the School of Common Sense, held a seminar within the framework of the work of the Youth Department of the AGP, the topic of which was the war in Syria and the new geopolitical alignment in the world. The president of the AGP, Colonel General Leonid Grigorievich Ivashov, made a presentation. The report touched upon important issues, features of the Arab tradition, geopolitical position of the Arab, Islamic, world in the system of civilization of the 21st century, why Washington is angry with Damascus, the end of the unipolar world order, new geopolitical alignment in the world. We provide a transcript of the speech, recorded by journalist Maria Monomanova. Geopolitics is the field of science that thinks in terms of historical epochs, planetary spaces, and civilizations. The Academy of Geopolitical Problems had to deal with the issue of Syria from the very beginning of the conflict. We were the first to write to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad a plan of operation to prevent U.S. aggression. Then I had a personal meeting with the President of Syria, active negotiations were and are being conducted. The Vice President of our Academy, Murat Mazitovic Musin, is constantly in Syria, keeping his finger on the pulse, reporting on the situation. What lies at the heart of the Syrian events and why cannot the Americans conquer a country that does not have rich reserves of hydrocarbons or some other raw material? We conclude that, in particular, the Syrian conflict is based on the most acute struggle for the world order that will be formed in the future. What will be the order? An American unipolar world? A monopolar, monetarist world that is subject to the power of money? Or will the world of the 21st century become a multipolar world after all? The Anglo-Saxon elite, the US state institutions are doing everything possible to ensure that the world exists only in the interests of the United States. The transnational community, led by the global financial elite, wants the transnational subject of world processes to build the world for themselves with the goal of their unconditional benefit, profit, and power. However, recent historical events show that humanity does not want to submit to either the first or second options for the world order, since these two options suppress the will of independent states, deprive them of the slightest degree of legal independence and national identity. The exception here is China, India, North Korea, Cuba, who, in spite of everything, managed to maintain their independence, albeit relative. The absurdity lies in the fact that everyone sees that the UN has become helpless, it does not solve anything in the world either in terms of impulses for the development of mankind, or in regulating the systems of states. One thing is obvious, that the only answer to the challenge thrown to the states is the entry into the political world arena not of individual states, but of world ethnocultural civilizations or their prototypes in the form of interstate formations. In 1869, N.Y.A. Danilevsky in his book, Russia and Europe, wrote that on the stage of world history, the main actors are not ethnic groups and states, but cultural and historical types, i.e. civilizations. The process of formation of interstate formations is going on all over the globe today. In connection with the recent events in Syria, it can already be said that a unipolar world has not taken place. The mood prevailing in the world can confidently be characterized as anti-American. Vice President of the Academy Konstantin Valentinovich Sivkov was invited to Mexico City for an international conference in May. He said that on the eve of the event the whole city was pasted over with posters, among which one could see the following, Latin America in the post-American era. That is, there is a process of formation of civilizations, which Danilevsky wrote about. We see that in Europe the Romano-Germanic matrix today is trying to separate from the Anglo-Saxon matrix. We see how the Chinese set an example for everyone. The Chinese phenomenon lies in the fact that all Chinese feel that they belong to the Chinese civilization. 
the most complicated processes are going on in India, etc. Samuel Huntington in 1993 blew up the world with his modest book The Clash of Civilizations, in which he described the dynamics of modern international relations through the prism of civilizational processes and related conflicts. He refuted all the official political science of the United States and the West in general and said that today's world is already a world of civilizations. The political scientists believed that in the emerging world, the main source of conflicts would no longer be ideology or economics. The major boundaries that divide humanity and the predominant sources of conflict will be determined by culture. The nation-state will remain the main actor in international affairs, but Huntington associated the most significant conflicts of global politics with the categories of the nation and groups belonging to different civilizations. The fault lines between civilizations, Huntington wrote, these are the lines of future fronts. I constantly repeat to my students that the civilizational code does not allow Russia to be an ally of the West. Europe is hostile to Russia. Just as the West cannot be an ally to the Eastern world. In the conclusion of his book, Huntington wrote that the main clashes of an intercivilizational plan would take place between Western civilization and the Islamic world. All this is happening right before our eyes. Historically, the Arab world is characterized by the presence of both a single political leader and a leading state. Today there is neither such a state nor such a leader and, unfortunately, it is not expected. The Arab world, like Russia, does not have its own geopolitical, civilizational development project. In the Arab East, Syria and Libya were closest to the creation of a new national development project, as they stood in the way of the synthesis of religion and power, the market and new technologies. Today, the Arab East lags behind not only the West, which was typical for all its periods of existence, but also from a number of other countries, it has been turned into a kind of personnel serving the interests of the West and the interests of transnational companies. For example, the GDP of 21 countries in the Arab world is comparable to the GDP of one Spain, whose population is seven times smaller. In all respects, the Arab world is uncompetitive. According to the Moscow State Linguistic University, in 2005, domestic investments in the Arab world amounted to about 10 billion. Including the Arab East invested almost a trillion dollars outside. And here the question arises, is the Arab world so bad, or is someone satisfied with its unpromising situation? Lawrence of Arabia, resident of British intelligence in the Middle East, reported to the London office, our task in the Middle East is to make the Arabs fight against the Arabs, this is the main British interest. This formula is still relevant today, it is a classic. We have seen the process of gradual replacement of independent power structures by pro-American dependence. Islam used to act from the standpoint of criticism of US policy, but today these states support it. Today Americans have rehabilitated radical Islamic groups such as Al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood as a kind of locomotive force. They used to sign them up for terrorist organizations, but today these extremist groups are their allies and friends. Everything is being done to ensure that Islam is forever seething in internecine strife, so that the Islamic world cannot unite into a civilizational core and so that the Islamic world does not enter the path of development. And in this regard, Syria is especially hated by the West because it shows the whole Eastern unbroken character, stubbornly offers a model of an independent Arab state, indicates priorities, defends its independence and the right to prosperity in the region. In addition, there is another factor that irritates the West. As you know, Iranian oil is not subject to the United States, Iran supplies oil to China. Syria is a stepping stone on the approaches to Iran. And in order to strike at Europe and China, it is important for the US to blow up the Middle East, which is what they are doing. China is being hit with hydrocarbon raw materials, and Europe, which is in stagnation, is being hit by an increase in oil prices and an increase in the population due to migrants. The European economy can no longer cope with these two pressure factors. The war in the Middle East is also designed to reduce Russia's authority in the region. Note that over the past 20 years, it was precisely those states and their leaders who sympathized with Russia, who were our allies, who were subjected to persecution and destruction. Slobodan Milosevic was killed, Saddam Hussein was hanged, Muammar Gaddafi was torn to pieces. Now there is a gross aggression against Bashar al-Assad. Russia has such a powerful development potential which is three to four times greater than the US. I criticized the actions of V. Putin and the foreign ministry a lot, 
but look at the latest events related to Syria. In the past 25 years, Russia objected to the United States for the first time, and as soon as she said her confident word, Obama was immediately left alone. Yes, Saudi Arabia and Qatar are ready to pay the Americans for their campaigns, but only Turkey is willing to fight. That's what Russia means. The US itself is now in critical condition, and Europe is in crisis. That is, the Western-centric world is no longer taking shape. It only emerged after the collapse of the USSR, but did not take place. The world is moving more and more decisively towards multipolarity. We are convinced that it will develop not on the basis of states, but on the basis of civilizations. The Eurasian Union will not be dominated by any individual countries, there will be distributed leadership, Russia will become a leader in one direction, India in another, China in a third, and so on. Each member of the Union is valuable in its own way, and each will play its own special role. It is necessary to follow the principle of balance of interests. This project should meet the interests of practically all countries of the world and all peoples. And then his prospects will be really great. When we conceived the structure, which later became the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, we called it differently, RISI, Russia, India, China, Iran. These four states are matrices of special civilizations. And Ricky was conceived as the second pole of the world, an alternative to the West, as a new continental center of power. But in the course of negotiations, primarily with China, the PRC offered to consider India necessarily jointly, paired with Pakistan. As a result, the SCO was created instead of RISI, reformatting the Shanghai 5 into the 6. This was the first stage in the development of regional cooperation. This structure lived up to expectations, effectively fulfilling the set of tasks that were set for the SCO. But then it was necessary to proceed to the second stage of its development, to expand, including India, Pakistan and necessarily Iran, and then Mongolia and Afghanistan. Then the SCO should be reformatted into the Eurasian Union, a union of states and civilizations. The fact that Russia supported India and Pakistan's bids for SCO membership is, of course, the right step. The Shanghai Organization in the form of the Eurasian Union will logically fit into the foundation of a new world, where there will be Russia, the Eurasian Union, the Eurasian Union, and BRICS. And it will be more effective both in terms of international security, and in terms of the world economy, and in terms of world politics. The SCO is becoming an increasingly useful organization for the whole world. Turkey is showing interest in it. Japan may also be interested. For Russia, the SCO is very important because, firstly, through this organization we harmonize the interests of large continental Eurasian states, and secondly, we reduce the probabilistic potentials of possible threats. The great Englishman Sir Halford MacKinder wrote that Russia is the heartland, the heart of the world, without control over which control over Eurasia is impossible. It is vitally important for Russia today to launch two parallel processes. I spoke about this with V. Putin. The wise Chinese teach, if you want to know the future, study the past. It is necessary to form the surrounding space to recreate civilization. We have the unique experience of the Soviet Union, where two matrices coexisted, Orthodox Slavic and Russian Turkic Eurasian. Source, Russian Folk Line, the 21st of October 2013. Russia in Geopolitics. Geopolitical picture of the world of the XXI century. The first decade of the 21st century can be considered a decade of unfulfilled hopes. The grandiose plans and aspirations of the great powers and regional entities have failed. The US plans to build a unipolar world did not come true, the EU lost hope that a soft America in the person of Barack Obama would give Europe the opportunity to free itself from American tutelage and take the lead in world politics. China no longer has the will or even the ability to comply with Deng Xiaoping's call to hide our potential and wait for the opportunity. It seems that this case has come, if at the end of the 20th century Washington had some illusions about the sole global governance, Today the United States, as the state of the highest rank, is losing control over world processes, and its elite is anxiously talking about the ways the American society will survive. It is interesting in such a situation to follow the evolution of the views of the geopolitical planner Z. Brzezinski. This he painted in the Grand Chessboard, and other works and speeches, charms and inevitability, of the world order under the auspices of the United States. In fact, 
Brzezinski carried out geopolitical planning of the world for the interests of America, more precisely, the American elite. Let us recall his passages regarding Russia, such as, the future world order will be built on the ruins of Russia, at the expense of Russia and against Russia. Mr. Brzezinski paid special attention to Eurasia, since he is an apologist for the thesis of H. Makeda, that world domination is possible only in the case of domination in Eurasia, and the latter is impossible without domination over Russia. America is interested in preserving and strengthening the existing pluralism on the map of Eurasia, ensuring prevention of the emergence of a hostile coalition, and even more so of a state capable of challenging. In the medium term, the aforementioned should give way to the emergence of increasingly important and strategically compatible partners who, under the leadership of America could help create a trans-Eurasian security system, Brzezinski 36. Grand Chessboard. America's dominance and its geostrategic imperatives. M. Mesdunaradni Artnashenia, 2002, page 235. What kind of coalition hostile to the United States and what kind of power capable of challenging is being discussed, I believe, the reader understands, this is Russia and China in the first place. That world domination is possible only in the case of domination in Eurasia, and the latter is impossible without domination over Russia. America is interested in preserving and strengthening the existing pluralism on the map of Eurasia, ensuring prevention of the emergence of a hostile coalition, and even more so of a state capable of challenging. In the medium term, the aforementioned should give way to the emergence of increasingly important and strategically compatible partners who, under the leadership of America could help create a trans-Eurasian security system, Brzezinski 36. Grand Chessboard. America's Dominance and Its Geostrategic Imperatives. M. Mesdunaradni Artnashenia, 2002, page 235. What kind of coalition hostile to the United States and what kind of power capable of challenging is being discussed, I believe, the reader understands, this is Russia and China in the first place. That world domination is possible only in the case of domination in Eurasia, and the latter is impossible without domination over Russia. America is interested in preserving and strengthening the existing pluralism on the map of Eurasia, ensuring prevention of the emergence of a hostile coalition, and even more so of a state capable of challenging. In the medium term, the aforementioned should give way to the emergence of increasingly important and strategically compatible partners who, under the leadership of America could help create a trans-Eurasian security system, Brzezinski 36. Grand Chessboard. America's Dominance and Its Geostrategic Imperatives. M. Mesdunaradni Artnashenia, 2002, page 235. What kind of coalition hostile to the United States and what kind of power capable of challenging is being discussed, I believe, the reader understands, this is Russia and China in the first place. And the latter is impossible without domination over Russia. America is interested in preserving and strengthening the existing pluralism on the map of Eurasia, ensuring prevention of the emergence of a hostile coalition, and even more so of a state capable of challenging. In the medium term, the aforementioned should give way to the emergence of increasingly important and strategically compatible partners who, under the leadership of America could help create a trans-Eurasian security system, Brzezinski 36. Grand Chessboard. America's Dominance and Its Geostrategic Imperatives. M. Mesdunaradni Artnashenia, 2002, page 235. What kind of coalition hostile to the United States and what kind of power capable of challenging is being discussed, I believe, the reader understands, this is Russia and China in the first place. And the latter is impossible without domination over Russia. America is interested in preserving and strengthening the existing pluralism on the map of Eurasia, ensuring prevention of the emergence of a hostile coalition, and even more so of a state capable of challenging. In the medium term, the aforementioned should give way to the emergence of increasingly important and strategically compatible partners who, under the leadership of America could help create a trans-Eurasian security system, Brzezinski 36. Grand Chessboard. America's Dominance and Its Geostrategic Imperatives. M. Mesdunaradni Artnashenia, 2002, page 235. What kind of coalition hostile to the United States and what kind of power capable of challenging is being discussed, I believe, the reader understands, this is Russia and China in the first place. 
America is interested in preserving and strengthening the existing pluralism on the map of Eurasia, ensuring prevention of the emergence of a hostile coalition, and even more so of a state capable of challenging. In the medium term, the aforementioned should give way to the emergence of increasingly important and strategically compatible partners who, under the leadership of America could help create a trans-Eurasian security system, Brzezinski 36. Grand Chessboard. America's Dominance and Its Geostrategic Imperatives. M. Mesduneradni Artnashenia, 2002, page 235. What kind of coalition hostile to the United States and what kind of power capable of challenging is being discussed, I believe, the reader understands, this is Russia and China in the first place. America is interested in preserving and strengthening the existing pluralism on the map of Eurasia, ensuring prevention of the emergence of a hostile coalition, and even more so of a state capable of challenging. In the medium term, the aforementioned should give way to the emergence of increasingly important and strategically compatible partners who, under the leadership of America could help create a trans-Eurasian security system, Brzezinski 36. Grand Chessboard. America's Dominance and Its Geostrategic Imperatives. M. Mesduneradni Artnashenia, 2002, page 235. What kind of coalition hostile to the United States and what kind of power capable of challenging is being discussed, I believe, the reader understands, this is Russia and China in the first place. Capable of challenging. In the medium term, this should give way to the emergence of increasingly important and strategically compatible partners who, under American leadership, could help create a trans-Eurasian security system, Brzezinski 36. Grand Chessboard. American Dominance and Its Geostrategic Imperatives. M. International Relations, 2002. S. 235. What kind of coalition hostile to the United States and what kind of power capable of challenging is being discussed, I believe, the reader understands, this is Russia and China in the first place. Capable of challenging. In the medium term, this should give way to the emergence of increasingly important and strategically compatible partners who, under American leadership, could help create a trans-Eurasian security system, Brzezinski 36. Grand Chessboard. American Dominance and Its Geostrategic Imperatives. M. International Relations, 2002. S. 235. What kind of coalition hostile to the United States and what kind of power capable of challenging is being discussed, I believe, the reader understands, this is Russia and China in the first place. American Dominance and Its Geostrategic Imperatives. M. International Relations, 2002. S. 235. What kind of coalition hostile to the United States and what kind of power capable of challenging is being discussed, I believe, the reader understands, this is Russia and China in the first place. American Dominance and Its Geostrategic Imperatives. M. International Relations, 2002. S. 235. What kind of coalition hostile to the United States and what kind of power capable of challenging is being discussed, I believe, the reader understands, this is Russia and China in the first place. But here is what the same Brzezinski says on October 14, 2011 in Normandy at the presentation of the A. Tocqueville Prize to him, the current United States and the entire Western world are not at all the same as they were before. The Western world is currently in decline due to lack will to unity, military review. Well, one can argue about the will to unity as the main reason for the decline of the West, but the decline of the US and the West is a fait accompli. But through the mouth of Brzezinski speaks the design geopolitics of the West, not a statement of decline, but an updated geopolitical project of the American and European elite, primarily the financial one. And the essence of this project is the same, the subjugation of all mankind through the creation of a world government and the expansion of the Atlantic Union at the expense of Russia, Ukraine, and Turkey. Brzezinski reveals a great geopolitical secret in his last remarks, the salvation of the West, as it happened more than once in history, is impossible without the participation of Russia. And the second secret of Zbigniew, the world is striving for bipolarity along the West-East axis, his phrase is characteristic, the power of the East is constantly growing against the backdrop of the decline of the West. And the West needs Russia to confront the East. But the West is no longer a single whole, these are two different civilizational entities that are in a state of geopolitical confrontation. Main subject. 
and in this confrontation between national elites, the global financial oligarchy comes to the fore in order to create a single world space with a world government under the rule of money. Nation states are slowly but steadily losing control of their space. International actors are becoming the world financial oligarchy, based on closed clubs of the super-rich people and TNCs, in whose hands the real power is, as well as the civilizations of the East and West. But it seems that the transnational community is the leading subject of world processes, with the help of money and network management, it dictates its will to sovereign states. The financial structures that manage global processes and are scattered around the world have several levels. The highest level, the World Financial Center, MFC, today there are 16 of them, in the coming years there will be 22. The middle level, Transnational Banks, TNB, more than 1,000. And the last level is the national banks associated with transnational centers. The most important issue in the formation of the geopolitical structure of the future world is the behavior of the global financial oligarchy, Fin in turn, which has been powerfully influencing the formation of world historical processes for more than two centuries. Today, under its control are, a significant part, more than 70%, of the world's monetary resources, precious metals, hydrocarbon raw materials. Up to 80% of the world's leading media are also controlled by the largest financial institutions and TNCs. The global network controls the USA, Great Britain, Russia, the EU, through world banks they are approaching the financial system of the PRC in order to establish control over its economy. It also has a system of global governing bodies for economic and political processes, the Davos Forum, the G8, the G20, the Bilderberg Club, the World Bank, the IMF, etc., shadow armed and special forces, private military corporations, terrorist groups, a global drug mafia with an annual turnover of about dollar. One trillion. It actually has NATO, OSCE, PACE and other structures at its disposal. The financial oligarchy is persistently implementing the strategy of a monopolar, dispersed, world order based on the omnipotent power of money. The basic basis of the Finton is still the US financial reserve system, the financial groups of the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, and the Vatican. It is difficult to say how this subject of global governance will behave in the process of a cardinal reorganization of the world. One thing is clear, he will not give up his positions without a fight. The contours of his strategy are being read, a world government, the transfer of financial infrastructure to East Asia, the creation of a planetary arc of instability, the establishment of a financial dictatorship. That is the approval of global financial fascism. The elites and governments of states become objects of control, and through financial control over them, the state is colonized, financial colonization. In colonial states, the role of the national elite is to carry out the will of the global elite and implement the goals and objectives set for them. To be a national elite today means not to associate oneself with the native people, but to be part of the world establishment. The responsibility to the global elite far exceeds the responsibility to one's own people. This means that all their rhetoric about democracy, fair elections, about the political sovereignty of the country is a bait for simpletons. This means the rejection of democracy is such, because no one elected the world elite. It is co-opted by one or another part of the national elite of any country. And then this elite reports not to the people of this country, but to their brothers in the bed, to the global oligarchy. They have nothing to do with the people of the country where they live, their work has its own logic and morality. The national elite must renounce entrepreneurial and all other productive activities for the benefit of their own state and must ensure free access for the global usurious elite to the national wealth of the country of residence. The fulfillment of the will of the world financial centers will provide a place in the global financial structures for representatives of the national oligarchic elites. And the global elite will be provided with guaranteed profits and total control over the sovereignty of states. To achieve world domination, the world financial centers set themselves the following tasks and stages. The first stage is the creation of a systemic crisis and instability on the planet. The second is the organization of famine and natural disasters. The third is the formation of public opinion in favor of global anti-crisis management and the formation of a world government. To expand and deepen the influence of world financial centers, it is necessary to form the image of an enemy in the eyes of the world community. In the past, this was the USSR, today it is Islamic terrorism, Libya, Syria, Iran, and in the short term China may well become. 
To do this, it will be necessary to create an aggressive anti-Chinese arc around the Celestial Empire, civilizational centers of world power and their strategies. World ethnocultural civilizations, regional civilizational associations, of East and West still play a secondary role in the formation of planetary processes. At the same time, there is an active formation of geopolitical centers of power on a cultural and civilizational basis. The centers of the first magnitude are North America, Europe, China. There is intense competition between them not only for leadership, but also for survival. At the same time, North America and, to a lesser extent, Europe serve as the body of the global financial oligarchy, but they are also waging a quiet war for independence from the financial oligarchy and TNCs at the state level, shares, Occupy Wall Street, the Y generation, etc. India, as a world civilization, is dynamically gaining power, but it is still the second tier, like Japan, Russia, and Brazil. The Islamic world is fragmented and lags behind in development, looking for its own civilizational path. Latin America has only just begun civilization building. Africa, with the destruction of M. Gaddafi, will not acquire its originality and independence in development for a long time. Such a configuration of world forces, the multidirectionality of their actions create a system of intractable contradictions for all mankind. The first vice president of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, Doctor of Military Sciences K. V. Tsivkov, in his article, Assessing the Probability of a World War, identifies seven main contradictions and disproportions that gave rise to the global systemic crisis of the 21st century. The contradiction between the growth of production consumption and the available resources necessary for development, the capabilities of the Earth's ecosystem. Disproportions in the distribution of industrial capacities and raw materials, which gave rise to a conflict of interest between industrialized countries and countries supplying raw materials. The contradiction between poor, developing countries and rich, industrialized ones. Contradiction between nations, national elites and transnational elite. The contradiction between the volume of the global, financial bubble and the scale of the real sector of the world economy. The contradiction between the huge global financial power of the transnational financial elite and the lack of its political subjectivity. The contradiction between the lack of spirituality of the free market which generates the power of money and the spiritual foundations for the existence of various civilizations which form civilizational differences which generate the power of ideas to one degree or another. Sivkov K. V. Estimation of the probability of a world war forward slash forward slash management of the metropolis. M. 2009. Number 2. How is the West trying to resolve these contradictions, oligarchy plus national elites? First, transfer under the so-called international control of the most important natural resources and strategic communications. In case of resistance from sovereign states, color revolutions are launched on their territories, democratic coups, crises, etc. are organized. But if the peaceful option does not work, then the forceful method of solving the problem is launched, Yugoslavia, Iraq, Libya. Second, the formalization of the governing global structures. Who, for example, created the G8, the G20, the Davos Forum? Who authorized the United States to impose international sanctions, to exercise international justice? However, the decisions of these and similar bodies are in fact binding on the world community of states. Other options are also being implemented such as giving global functions to NATO. The strategic concept of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, adopted by the heads of state and government in Lisbon, November 2010, assigns NATO the right to deploy reliable military forces where and when necessary for our security and promote common security in cooperation with our partners in all over the world. As the world changes, NATO's core mission will remain the same, to ensure that the alliance remains an unparalleled community of freedom, peace, security, and shared values. But if we discard empty words, then NATO declares the right to control the whole world by military force, based on the generally accepted postulates of protecting human rights, combating terrorism, nuclear proliferation, drugs, and so on. But in fact, after the adoption of such a concept in the face of NATO, a power tool was legitimized to maintain the power of money, the power of the transnational oligarchy. But their power will be strong as long as the dollar is strong. As long as most countries in the world are ready to keep their money resources in dollars and settle accounts with each other in American currency, 
the U.S. and the financial oligarchy will grow fat and rule. Reducing the territory of the dollar will inevitably lead to its weakening and a decrease in the influence of its producers on world processes. Changing the philosophy of human life, more spirituality, morality. Key, strategically important, areas of the world, strategic communications, and global resources become the main objects of geopolitical confrontation. The possession of these objects will largely determine the geopolitical status of civilizations and groups of states, the dynamics of their development, the degree of external and internal security, and the level of sovereignty. The main sphere of geopolitical struggle in the 21st century is the cultural and civilizational environment and the spiritual sphere. The destruction or absorption of world civilizations, changing their essence is one of the main tasks of the West and the financial elites. For a controlled world space, a universal world religion is needed, and such is being formed in the person of Judeo-Christianity. The dynamics of civilizational processes allows us to make some predictions and conclusions. Thus, the inability of states to resist global mafia structures gives rise as a response to the emergence on the world stage of larger socio-political players, civilizations and civilizational unions. And in this situation, Russia has a historical chance to make its messianic contribution to the construction of a new just world order. Russia's geopolitical project. Eastern civilizations, primarily China and India, are developing most dynamically and gaining leading positions in world processes. But can they offer humanity an integral world project? It is unlikely, since they themselves compete with each other for resources, for territories of influence. Russia can and must come up with such a project with confidence that it will be supported by the overwhelming majority of the peoples of the world. Because it will be a project expected by humanity, messianic in essence, global in scope, aimed at the survival and development of all the peoples of the world, in content. The project of geopolitical intelligence and reason of mankind. It is reason, and not animal pragmatism. I. N. Ostretsov, a full member of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, writes, the intellect, endowed with the properties of reason, is able to create constructions the probability of their occurrence within the framework of a purely stochastic process is practically equal to zero. Only the mind, once having arisen, cannot die due to the fact that it is able to improve the forms of its existence. Thus, an absolutely necessary condition for development is an increase in the intellectual part of mankind, Ostretsov I Introduction to the Philosophy of Nonviolent Development, Moscow, 2009, pp 57, 61. For Russia itself, this will be a project of restoration of the civilizational essence and transformation, based not on bare pragmatism, but on reasonable principles and the geopolitical potential of the fatherland. Otherwise, we, Russia, will become a third-rate Asian country, according to Brzezinski, or leave the historical process altogether. Cannot perish due to the fact that he is able to improve the forms of his existence. Thus, an absolutely necessary condition for development is an increase in the intellectual part of humanity, Ostretsov I, Introduction to the Philosophy of Nonviolent Development. M. 2009, page 57, 61. For Russia itself, this will be a project of restoration of the civilizational essence and transformation, based not on bare pragmatism, but on reasonable principles and the geopolitical potential of the fatherland. Otherwise, we, Russia, will become a third-rate Asian country, according to Brzezinski, or leave the historical process altogether. Cannot perish due to the fact that he is able to improve the forms of his existence. Thus, an absolutely necessary condition for development is an increase in the intellectual part of humanity, Ostretsov I, Introduction to the Philosophy of Nonviolent Development. M. 2009, page 57, 61. For Russia itself, this will be a project of restoration of the civilizational essence and transformation, based not on bare pragmatism, but on reasonable principles and the geopolitical potential of the fatherland. Otherwise, we, Russia, will become a third-rate Asian country, according to Brzezinski, or leave the historical process altogether. With 57, 61. For Russia itself, this will be a project of restoration of the civilizational essence and transformation, based not on bare pragmatism but on reasonable principles and the geopolitical potential of the fatherland. Otherwise, we, Russia, will become a third-rate Asian country, according to Brzezinski, or leave the historical process altogether. With 57, 61. For Russia itself, 
This will be a project of restoration of the civilizational essence and transformation, based not on bare pragmatism, but on reasonable principles and the geopolitical potential of the fatherland. Otherwise, we, Russia, will become a third-rate Asian country, according to Brzezinski, or leave the historical process altogether. To develop and promote the Russian project, first of all, it is necessary to concentrate the scientific potential of the country and master the method of geopolitical analysis, geopolitical forecasting, and geopolitical planning of the world. This methodology was mastered many years ago by the Anglo-Saxons, Stalin, the Rothschilds, and the Vatican. Today, the Academy of Geopolitical Problems, Russia, also possesses this methodology in collaboration with other social and scientific organizations. The project is proposed to be based on the geopolitical doctrine of Russia, in which to give an objective analysis of world processes, to prove the impracticability and catastrophic nature of both Western and Mondialist, transnational, projects for humanity. To reveal the positive potential of human civilization, capable of preserving all the peoples of the world with its reasonable implementation, giving impetus to their comprehensive development. To reflect the types of civilizational order desired for Russia, and for all mankind, the geopolitical configuration of the world and the system of principles of behavior of the world community. Declare Russia's claim to the role of the Eurasian geopolitical center and geopolitical allies of Russia, without naming specific countries and civilizations, but limiting itself only to the principles of determining allied forces and ideological and religious systems. To offer the world community its own vision of the content and meaning of human existence, the role and functions of the economy and finance as a means of developing culture, science, education, social communications, and not a means of profit and super-enrichment. To offer the world an international security system based on the principles of an inter-civilizational balance of power laid down in the renewed UN Charter, which encourages the development of collective security systems and the exclusion of military operations as a means of resolving disputes and conflicts. Offering mankind a geopolitical project, Russia must also change its essential strategy, again on the basis of intellect and reason. In particular, to develop their own geopolitical theory of the 21st century, Russian specialists are ready to develop it, where the main subjects of world processes will be not individual states, but civilizations. Initiate the formation of an inter-civilizational community as part of civilizations that disagree with the world order of the Golden Billion, Russia, the CIS countries, China, the Islamic world, Latin America, a number of countries in Western Europe and Africa. To promote the development of such international organizations as the SCO, BRICS, ASEAN, to establish cooperation with the OIC, the Arab League, Latin America. To start forming a new international financial system, at the first stage close to the dollar, based on the yuan, ruble, dinar, acu. Promote the creation of an integrated system of collective security in the format of interaction between the SCO, BRICS, CSTO, ASEAN. Speed up the registration of membership in the SCO of India, Iran, Mongolia, invitation as candidates of Vietnam, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and other countries. To develop and implement a project of the fourth geopolitical space consisting of Russia, CIS, India, Iran, Afghanistan, possibly Japan, and other countries. Propose the modernization of the UN and its Security Council, the transfer of their activities to the civilizational principle, UN Security Council permanent representatives from Russia, CIS, hash China, India, Islamic countries, Latin America, Africa, Japan, Europe, North America, to intensify the unification of efforts within the framework of the CIS, Eurasian Union, SCO, BRICS to develop breakthrough innovative technologies, especially in the nuclear, nanomolecular and other fields, to develop new security systems. The process of world reconstruction can and should be organized by Russia, India, and China. Three continental, self-sufficient powers, three civilizations with their spiritual values that do not experience antagonism towards each other, are quite capable of jointly drawing the outlines of a new world order without the hegemony of the Anglo-American military and the global usurious, parasitic oligarchy. Today there is no civilization that does not feel, openly or secretly, hatred of the West. And Russia is obliged to lead this process. Such is its historical and geopolitical destiny. Source, Global Conflict, the 24th of October 2013. The future belongs to Russia. J-O-U-I-N-A-L-I-S-T-S-K-A-Y-A Pravda, Leonid Grigorievich, let's start with one of the main issues of today. 
How would you assess the defense capability of our country? Leonid Ivashov, speaking about the country's defense capability, we usually mean its two main components, the armed forces and the military-industrial complex. But there are other elements of it, for example, the defense potential of the country can greatly complement the art of foreign policy. We are talking about the use of the international legal field, international organizations, the formation of military and political alliances, the creation of groups to prevent foreign aggressive actions. An important element of defense capability is the state of science, how capable it is of surpassing the enemy in research and development of more promising deterrent-type weapon systems, etc. If we talk about the material side of things, let's imagine a large modern building which has been systematically destroyed for 25 years, sometimes knocking out the supporting structures from it. This is exactly how things stand with our defense capability, and I would not say that it is at a high level. The equipment that is used today in the exercises, and hence the tactics of warfare, are samples of the 70-80s of the last century. Of course, we can fight terrorists with its help, but alas, we can't fight a serious enemy. Look what they have done in recent years with intelligence. It was dealt a severe blow, not only headquarters structures, but also the operational staff were reduced, effective units were disbanded, and their restoration will require not only huge finances, but also time. And the ill-conceived and hostile action to reform the organizational structure of the armed forces, when the headquarters of military districts and armies were destroyed, led to the liquidation of communication centers. As a result, a paradoxical situation has arisen today, when the general staff must directly control the remaining brigades. It is scary to talk about what has been done with military science and education, they have been destroyed. And without military science, one can only dream of victories over an enemy living in the first half of the 20th century. When Dmitry Rogozin was appointed to oversee the defense industry, he was confident that if the president allocated money, the army would quickly switch to new equipment. Over time, this confidence in Rogozin's speeches diminished. Privatization and subsequent devastation broke the defense industry as a system that included industry research institutes, experimental design bureaus, experimental production, test sites, etc. And today we see what is happening with our most promising weapon, the Balava missile, the GLONASS system. If in Soviet times the defense industry was at the level of the fifth technological order, today it hangs between the third and fourth. You are talking about a serious opponent. How seriously should we consider the threat from the Middle East one especially in the light of what we can observe today, the reformatting of the Middle East world under the influence of Wahhabi projects and the inability of Central Asia and Transcaucasia to contain the onslaught of radical Islamists. The nature and scale of threats, as well as their relevance, are now even higher than during the existence of the USSR. In those years, we had a calm north and a more or less calm east, the main threat was observed from the west. What do we have today? The battle for the Arctic is taking on the character of a military strategic operation, and Russia's response to the threat from the north is attempts to restore at least some power of the northern fleet. We see an increase in threats from the east, from America and Japan. In addition, we do not know how our friendly neighbor China will behave in the future. I dare to suggest that if we are weak, then our empty territories will fall off to him by themselves. The threat from the south is also growing. Turkey, which has the most powerful military in NATO after the United States, is showing quite aggressive behavior towards Syria, Iran, and Russia. Aggressive activity and arrogance is shown to the world by the Saudi Kingdom. The radical Islamist threat currently directed against our friends may in the near future spread to the North Caucasus. The possibility of a political fight over the Russian, southern streams, is not ruled out, this will happen if our economic interests are infringed. It is clear that against the background of possible conflicts, NATO, as an instrument for protecting the oligarchic interests of the West, will definitely intervene, God forbid, not by direct military action. The situation in the southern and southwestern strategic directions will be especially complicated if Ukraine can be torn away from Russia and dragged into the European Union. We have not learned how to counter this whole complex of threats. And until now, we are trying to shut up all social, interreligious and economic threats with a soldier or a policeman. And how was it before? Not under the USSR, but more recently, in the 90s? You were present, for example, at the talks on Yugoslavia. How did Russia behave then? 
Yeltsin was hammered into Yeltsin's head by a false geopolitical idea that our well-being lies in the West. His idea, expressed in 1992, that our goal is to integrate into the Western civilizational community, is criminal from a geopolitical point of view, because antipodal civilizations with different value systems cannot coexist together. They can only cooperate and ally on mutually beneficial aspects of politics. After all, what does it mean to integrate into Western civilization? This means giving up your history, identity, value system. But this idea sat firmly in the brain of Boris Nikolaevich, and when the question arose of supporting our historical ally, Yugoslavia, Yeltsin defended it only in words. In fact, he often retired on his own. And then I had to take the initiative into my own hands. The then Prime Minister of Russia, Cherno Murdin, was played well by the Americans. In the late 90s, he dreamed of the presidency, and at a meeting with Al Gore, where Bill Clinton, accidentally, dropped in, an agreement was reached that the Americans would support his candidacy in the next elections in Russia. At the request of the same Clinton, Cherno Murdin was soon appointed special representative for Yugoslavia, and in this post he did everything to please the United States. He also played a certain role in the adoption of the American plan for resolving the situation in the Yugoslav space. In fact, he changed the existing directive of the President of the Russian Federation, which spoke of the need to achieve an immediate cessation of hostilities. I even had to tell Viktor Stepanovich that he was betraying not only the national interests of Russia and betraying the Serbs, but he doesn't listen to his president either. It turns out that his role can be called provocative and treacherous. I remember very well how Chernomerdin urged Slobodan Milosevic and the Serbian leadership to accept the American course of action. How he lied at the same time, saying that Kosovo would remain part of Yugoslavia, and the army would remain in its previous form. And at the same time he threatened that if Belgrade did not sign the American conditions, Russia would stop providing him with any assistance, political, economic, military. For my part, I tried to warn the Yugoslavs, if you sign the document, then there will be no integrity and independence, and you will not return Kosovo. And the famous Pristina throw of our paratroopers? Who was behind this decision? And how was our contingent eventually withdrawn from Yugoslavia? In those days, we prepared an analytical note for the Kremlin, which spoke about the need to provide for the simultaneous entry of our units into Kosovo with NATO. If the NATO forces get ahead of us, it will not only be the defeat of Russia, but also the humiliation of you as the supreme commander-in-chief and president. Yeltsin agreed. And then military art and cunning played their role. We were able to deceive the Americans and withdrew the battalion from the zone of operations of the NATO division, North, almost defiantly. The operation was not fully carried out, since it was originally planned to transfer three battalions, two, from the territory of Russia, but we were not allowed to fly, in violation of the Convention of the International Civil Aviation Organization. To say that the Russian paratroopers accomplished a feat would probably be too loud. But there is no doubt that this was an unprecedented geopolitical breakthrough when one battalion was able to change the balance of power not only in Europe, but also in the world. We occupied a strategic object and an important communication crossroads, an airfield, and not a single NATO plane could land on it without our knowledge. As a result, the United States agreed to revise its own document, which Chernomerdin had previously forced the Serbs to sign. Thus, Thanks to the actions of our paratroopers, the Americans were forced to reduce the already achieved victory. If we talk about the reasons for our departure, the military creates the conditions for a political and diplomatic offensive. We occupied a geopolitical foothold, after which it was necessary to develop this success, but already on the field of foreign policy. But it didn't work out. Why? Firstly, the fifth column in Russia was quite powerful, and even now it continues to remain so. In addition, when big businessmen are in power, and we saw that, in fact, the power in Russia in the 90s was exercised by the oligarchy, then the interests of their own pocket turned out to be much higher than the geopolitical interests of the country. The behavior of the most illiterate chief of the general staff, Mr. Kvashnin, also played a role. There is no need to talk about financiers, we are built into the American financial system, our financial model is controlled from across the ocean, the ruble is closely tied to the dollar. As a result, what we got happened. Let's talk in more detail about the negotiation process with the Americans. What are negotiations with America, how should they be conducted? To what extent can one negotiate with them, 
How much can one trust them? Many times I had to sit with US representatives at the negotiating table. They always act from a position of strength, I even called them, cowboys. If they bend you down a little, and you start to give in, they will push you until you are under their feet. Forceful pressure is their negotiating tactic. If one of the American generals, there are decent people among them, begins to agree with your logic, then the representatives of the State Department or the CIA who are present immediately begin to put pressure on them. I even once asked my partner Doc Fogelson if the Pentagon has political autonomy. Or is it better for us to immediately negotiate with other departments? What should be the behavior model in this case? Very simple, you need to act in solidarity with the American generals against the State Department and the CIA, and, together with your foreign ministry and other foreign policy structures, put pressure on American representatives. And never give in to their pressure. More often be, general no. So we were able to achieve the desired results. Plus, you need to take into account third parties, for example, the Finnish military was always present at the trilateral negotiations on the Kosovo issue, with whom we sometimes acted as a single team, to believe or not to believe the Americans. The entire history of US political strategy is based on the fact that you can only negotiate and abide by agreements on an equal footing if your partner is stronger or equal to you. With the weaker agreements are not respected. As long as the USSR was equivalent to the United States, the ABM Treaty and all other agreements were respected. As soon as the Soviet Union was gone and we weakened, the Americans began to behave in a completely different way. A simple example. The Americans committed many violations in the sphere of the START-1 treaty. Madeleine Albright and Yevgeny Primako sit down at the negotiating table, who gives her a list of violations and asks her to sort it out. Albright does not attach any importance to the paper and passes it to his assistants with the words, All right, Eugene, if I have time, I will read it. This is the approach to strategically important agreements. This logic of American policy has not changed. Back in the 19th century, a bill was presented in the US Congress which stated that there are civilized peoples, and there are wild and barbaric ones. And the latter are not political nations, and therefore do not have political rights. Russian Americans have always considered and still consider barbarians. Although in terms of culture, education, and science, the Soviet Union stood two heads higher than the United States. How can all these factors affect our security in the future? Where to look for clearance for Russia? First of all, I should note that America is ending, as well as Western civilization. She has reached her peak. Never since ancient times has the West been spiritually and politically united. Today this manifests itself both within Europe and in the fierce struggle of European integration with the Anglo-Saxon world. In addition, in the West there is a powerful contradiction between the financial oligarchy and ordinary citizens. Along with the economic crisis and the crisis of statehood, we observe there a complete degradation in the spiritual and moral sphere. Russia today has a great chance to become the world leader in the system of spiritual and moral values, in the field of justice and international legal relations. In addition, our country has a huge geopolitical potential, we have vast expanses, richest resources, the ability to connect the West with the East. The peoples of the world look at us with hope, and when they trust you, it multiplies strength. That is why I see the future in Russia. But first, we will have to change the essence of power, choose our own project that corresponds to our Eurasian identity, preserve the cultural and civilizational environment and launch our natural divine intellectual gift. Source. Journalistic Truth, the 8th of October 2013. Changing the World Order. Putin's new strategy is designed to change the global world order. The president of the Russian Federation VV Putin is recognized as the person of 2013. Which, of course, can cause pride for both Russians and people of the planet who sympathize with Russia. But what did Vladimir Vladimirovich do last year for humanity to advance to the position of the first man on the planet Earth? In general, not much. But this little unexpectedly changed the idea of the modern world order, in which the opinion has taken root that the first in the status of world powers can be a state with the greatest economic, military and technological potential. Indeed, here the United States is the undisputed leader, and Russia is only in the background. But in geopolitics, this science of all sciences, the components of leadership are different. Because the development of mankind, 
if we are talking about development, is driven by other values, high morality, deep knowledge, a sense of justice, respect for all peoples and countries, observance of the rules of planetary community. But these are the eternal values of the countries of the land. And in this regard, V. Putin carried out a revolution in the world public consciousness. Just because for the first time after the collapse of the USSR, he acted not ideologically or politically, but looked at the world with a geopolitical view and realized that Syria, Turkey and Iran, if they turn into countries controlled by the Atlanticist West, will be a springboard for a throw not only to the Caucasus, but also deep into Eurasia, that is, in the heart of Russia. And he gave a geopolitical battle to the sea robbers, that for the first time after the collapse of the USSR, he did not act ideologically or politically, but looked at the world with a geopolitical view and realized that Syria, Turkey and Iran, if they turn into countries controlled by the Atlanticist West, will be a springboard for throwing not only into the Caucasus, but also into the depths Eurasia, that is, in the heart of Russia. And he gave a geopolitical battle to the sea robbers. That for the first time after the collapse of the USSR, he did not act ideologically or politically, but looked at the world with a geopolitical view and realized that Syria, Turkey and Iran, if they turn into countries controlled by the Atlanticist West, will be a springboard for throwing not only into the Caucasus, but also into the depths Eurasia, that is, in the heart of Russia. And he gave a geopolitical battle to the sea robbers. First, he did not allow the dark forces of the West and their satellites in the Islamic world to destroy the Syrian Arab Republic, which was trying to pursue an independent political course and, in addition, be friends with Russia. For the first time in its entire new history, since the time of Gorbachev, Russia has exercised the right of veto in the UN Security Council, provided political, diplomatic and military support to Syria, despite the concentrated complex pressure of the West and the moneybags of the Middle East. What caused complete confusion in the political alignment of forces in the United States, upset the plans of financial globalizers and Islamic extremists acting together against recalcitrant states, called into question the effectiveness of the Anglo-Saxons geopolitical strategy aimed at world domination, global dominance. It would seem that the Russian leadership did nothing special, let alone supernatural, in the Syrian situation, but simply fulfilled its obligations in full accordance with the UN Charter, in particular, with art. 2. Paragraphs 4.7, Prohibiting Interference in the Internal Affairs of the Member States of the United Nations. Russia acted as a country entrusted by mankind to maintain international peace, to protect sovereign states from world robbers. But after all, such interference has happened before, undisguised armed aggressions that led to the destruction of statehood in Yugoslavia, Iraq, Libya, the invasion of the NATO armada into Afghanistan, the blockade and the threat of war against Iran, the regular robbery actions of Israel. Russia remained silent or whined plaintively about the excessive use of military force, that is, it acted not in the format of the UN Charter, not in the geopolitical dimension, but within the framework of US-led operations, having agreed in advance with the aggressor its passive whining role. This line of behavior was conceived under Gorbachev, continued under Yeltsin, early Putin, received a hypertrophied manifestation under Medvedev. And the reasons for such inadequate behavior were, absolute rejection of the laws of geopolitics, substitution of national interests for, universal, values, Gorbachev, geopolitically erroneous essence of the strategy of embedding, at any cost in the Western, civilized, community, Yeltsin, attempts to maintain the high status of the Russian state and solve internal problems through personal friendship between the leaders of the United States and the Russian Federation, Putin before and Medvedev after 2008, as well as wide penetration into the structures of public administration, the media, political parties and public organizations of agents of Western influence, fifth column. And, since the USSR, Russia, was the antipode of the Western world, the second pole of the planet, the personification of continental justice in international affairs, its destruction led first to chaos and imbalance in the existing world order, and then to dictate from the surviving pole, the American political elite in the union with the oligarchic financial international. The majority of the countries of the world submitted to the financial and force dictate, Russia being among the first. Those who tried to object were, democratized, by rocket and bomb strikes or, color, revolutions. It would seem that no one can stop the destruction of beautiful Syria, the first Christian state in their history. However, again, as in previous centuries, Russia acted as the bearer of truth and justice. 
and nothing more. In the summer of 2011, during our three-hour conversation with the President of the Syrian Arab Republic, Bashar al-Assad asked me whether Russia would act in the Syrian issue, as it did with Libya. I replied that I would not. And he explained that Medvedev was responsible for Libya, and Putin would fight for Syria. Bashar said tenderly, the whole country will pray for Mr. Putin. Of course, somewhere I was bluffing, but I was based on Putin's assessment of the Libyan drama, which was fundamentally different from Medvedev's position. And even earlier, as president of the Russian Federation, VV, Putin more than once quite objectively and sharply assessed the role of the United States and the West in world politics, speech after the Beslan tragedy, 2004, Munich, 2007, speech on international security and others in pre-election, 2012, articles, Putin also stated the need to strengthen the international security system, gave an objective assessment of global trends. What the world is facing today is a serious systemic crisis, a tectonic process of global transformation. The world is entering a zone of turbulence. And, of course, this period will be long and painful. There is no need to harbor illusions here, Putin vv, Russia is concentrating, challenges we must respond to, forward slash forward slash is vesti, the 6th of January 2012. True, tough words were not followed by toughness in foreign policy, especially in relations with the United States, in upholding national interests. Therefore, giving an answer to the president of the SAR, I hope that Putin, having headed the Russian Federation for the third time, would move from words to their practical implementation, and Syria is the touchstone on which Russia will no longer prove itself to be a satellite of the United States, but an independent global player. So, starting in 2011 the armed aggression against Syria, the Americans believed that Russia would not become an obstacle to the strategy of exporting instability, Medvedev remained the president of the Russian Federation for another whole year. But it happened differently. Firstly, Syria turned out to be a tough nut to crack and gave battle to the interventionists. Secondly, Russia supported the struggle of the Syrian people for their independence, thus inspiring China, Iran, India and even a number of Western European countries. Thirdly, Russian diplomacy has implemented, not yet completely, a plan for a political settlement of the situation in Syria. And v. Putin headed this, Syrian, process. That Russia will not become an obstacle to the, strategy of exporting instability, Medvedev remains the president of the Russian Federation for another year. But it happened differently. Firstly, Syria turned out to be a tough nut to crack and gave battle to the interventionists. Secondly, Russia supported the struggle of the Syrian people for their independence, thus inspiring China, Iran, India and even a number of Western European countries. Thirdly, Russian diplomacy has implemented, not yet completely, a plan for a political settlement of the situation in Syria. And v. Putin headed this, Syrian, process that Russia will not become an obstacle to the strategy of exporting instability, Medvedev remains the president of the Russian Federation for another year. But it happened differently. Firstly, Syria turned out to be a tough nut to crack and gave battle to the interventionists. Secondly, Russia supported the struggle of the Syrian people for their independence, thus inspiring China, Iran, India and even a number of Western European countries. Thirdly, Russian diplomacy has implemented, not yet completely, a plan for a political settlement of the situation in Syria. And v. Putin headed this, Syrian, process. Russian diplomacy has implemented, not yet completely, a plan for a political settlement of the situation in Syria. And v. Putin headed this, Syrian, process. Russian diplomacy has implemented, not yet completely, a plan for a political settlement of the situation in Syria. And v. Putin headed this, Syrian, process. The second thing v. Putin undertook, being only a candidate for the presidency of Russia, was to change the vector of foreign policy from pro-Western to Eurasian. The importance of this innovation was stressed by Mrs. U.S. Secretary of State H. Clinton, squealing that America would not allow integration in the post-Soviet space and the revival of the Soviet Empire. Nevertheless, even the customs union is already lining up. This should also include the intensification of the activities of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the BRICS Group. As for the latter, at the meeting of the heads of state of the group in Durban, South Africa, 2013, the beginnings of a new world order of the 21st century were laid, new approaches to world politics, resolutions condemning interference in the Syrian process, 
the creation of a financial and monetary fund, an alternative to the IMF, BRICS Bank, MB Alternative, transition in mutual trade to national currencies, replacement of the dollar as a reserve currency. The geopolitical line of Russia's behavior in world politics was calculated not to quarrel with the West, to be friends with the East, to build a new world order on the basis of non-Western civilizations. Let's also add to the above, the refusal to extradite Snowden to the Americans, which means a flick on the nose of official Washington, and the revival of the defense consciousness of the population, the restoration of the combat capability of the armed forces and the military-industrial complex of Russia. The appointment of General of the Army S. K. Chugu to the post of Minister of Defense of the Russian Federation to replace the completely stolen furniture store manager Sergei Yukov, the allocation of 23 trillion rubles for the rearmament of the Army and Navy, regular checks of the combat readiness of formations and associations also indicate a change in course in ensuring the military security of Russia. The former course, security through close cooperation with the US and NATO, is being replaced by security based on its own power and the system of international security. All this, plus the active political activity of V. Putin, made him the man of 2013. V. Putin started the new 2014 geopolitical year even more actively than the previous one. The brilliantly organized Winter Olympics and the victory of the Russian team raised Putin to the top of world popularity and strengthened the image of Russia and contributed to the consolidation of Russians around the president. But, perhaps, the most important thing is a strong geopolitical move to return Crimea and Sevastopol to Russia. The interests of natural monopolies, other accounting arguments faded into the background before the interests of a grand geopolitical strategy, the core of which lies in the phrase 36. Brzezinski, an independent Ukraine, independent of Russia, but not of the West. L.I. is a necessary condition to prevent Russia's return to the ranks of the world's leading powers. And Putin, together with Crimea, returns the country to the status of a great power. We recognize that the vast majority of countries and peoples of the world today applaud, some openly, some secretly, Russia and its president. And they hope that it is Russia that will stop the destructive march of US financial neo-fascism, offer humanity a new model of a world that is more just and safer. This was clearly stated by the President of the Russian Federation in his message to the Federal Assembly of the Russian Federation on March 18, 2014. It should be noted that this speech by V. Putin is fundamentally different from all the previous ones, this is the speech of a global geopolitics. No, embedded, in the world economy, in world politics, dependence on the West. Declared their own plan for the revival of the country and the reorganization of the world. Putin's domestic political strategy also reads a return to national historical sources, cultural and civilizational values, the matrix of which is a combination of holiness, conscience and justice. And this is also the geopolitics of continental conservatism, the continuation and development of the Russian tradition. There is also such an important definition in V. Putin's program, self-determination of the Russian people is a multi-ethnic civilization, strengthened by the Russian cultural core. Here, as in foreign policy, the contours of Russia's first geopolitical doctrine are clearly visible, Moscow is the third Rome, which has stood the test of time from the Muscovite Kingdom to the Soviet Union. Only deviations from it, attempts to integrate either into Europe or into the West as a whole led to internal Russian cataclysms. It seems that in foreign policy, President V. Putin, firstly, felt the strength of Russia, the power of its geopolitical potential. And secondly, I felt the taste of victory. More precisely, tactical success. Which follows, as the art of war teaches, to develop into an operational success, and then into a strategic victory. The return of Crimea is already an operational success. But in order to win, it is necessary to have a strictly verified strategy, both as a theory and as a strong-willed practical activity, without theory, we die. I, Stalin. Moreover, Russia's main opponents will by no means reconcile themselves to their defeat and will launch powerful counterattacks. The tragic events in Volgograd are just blind cruel revenge. For Syria, for Snowden. For Eurasian integration. But for Crimea, we should expect more thoughtful, comprehensive, more cynical and cruel actions of the main geopolitical enemy, which is the union of the Anglo-Saxon elite and world financial capital. Such a one has a centuries-old idea, world domination, a theoretical basis and a strategy of action, has a fairly powerful potential and historical experience in the destruction of rivals, 
is not limited by moral principles or international legal norms. What can Russia and Putin face in the near future and in the medium term? To answer this very multifaceted question, it is necessary to identify the underlying processes that determine world politics. So, the process of natural globalization today flows into the fiercest struggle for the global management of planetary processes, for the formation of the world order and the image of humanity in the 21st century. The leading players on this front are, Western civilization, the resurgent civilizations of the East, including the emerging Latin American civilizational matrix, the transnational community, financial international. The West and the transnationals act, as a rule, together against the East, competing with each other so far in particulars. This is a civilization that considers all countries of the world as an object of its prey. The East is still far from united and does not have a clear ideological and spiritual leader. Putin has to answer the question, is Russia, as the geopolitical center of the continental world and Eurasia, and is he personally ready to lead the anti-Western coalition in building a new world order that is more just and secure? Putin spoke about Russia's claim to the role of one of the leaders of the world in his election articles, is the source of her potential power. Putin vv, Russia and the changing world, forward slash forward slash, Moscow News, the 27th of February 2012. Russia can and must play a worthy role dictated by its civilizational model, great history, geography and its cultural genome, in which the fundamental foundations of European civilization and the centuries-old experience of interaction with the East are organically combined, Putin vv, Russia is concentrating, challenges we must respond to, forward slash forward slash is Vestia, the 16th of January 2012. That is, Putin, going to the third presidential term, consciously prepared himself for the role of the leader of that Russia which would position itself as an ideological and spiritual leader and even the savior of mankind. This is precisely the role of Russia, USSR, in the history of human civilization, to absorb the energy of the Huns and the Horde for the sake of saving Europe, to rid the world and Europe of the same generated corals, Napoleons, Hitlers. Assume the function of the Third Rome, the guardian of true Christian values. Preserve the purity of moderate Islam. Help the peoples of the Third World to free themselves from colonialism and build their own statehood. As for the civilizational model of Russia, it is also unique and fundamentally different from the civilized West. Colonizing and developing the vast expanses of Eurasia, the Russian people did not turn other peoples into slaves or into a source of their own enrichment, as the civilized West did, but helped them survive survive and raise them in development to the level of Russian culture, formed them into equal allies. In 1788, an event took place that has no analogues in world history. By decree of Catherine the Great, Russian Islam was officially invited as the second state religion, under the dominant orthodoxy, for the construction of a single spiritual, Eurasian, space of the empire. And this means that there are no fundamental disagreements between Russian Islam and orthodoxy. Then it is also unique and fundamentally different from the civilized West. Colonizing and developing the vast expanses of Eurasia, the Russian people did not turn other peoples into slaves or into a source of their own enrichment, as the civilized West did, but helped them survive, survive and raise them in development to the level of Russian culture, formed them into equal allies. In 1788, an event took place that has no analogues in world history. By decree of Catherine the Great, Russian Islam was officially invited as the second state religion, under the dominant orthodoxy, for the construction of a single spiritual, Eurasian, space of the empire. And this means that there are no fundamental disagreements between Russian Islam and orthodoxy. Then it is also unique and fundamentally different from the, civilized, West. Colonizing and developing the vast expanses of Eurasia, the Russian people did not turn other peoples into slaves or into a source of their own enrichment, as the, civilized, West did, but helped them survive, survive and raise them in development to the level of Russian culture, formed them into equal allies. In 1788, an event took place that has no analogues in world history. By decree of Catherine the Great, Russian Islam was officially invited as the second state religion, under the dominant orthodoxy, for the construction of a single spiritual, Eurasian, space of the empire. And this means that there are no fundamental disagreements between Russian Islam and orthodoxy. Colonizing and developing the vast expanses of Eurasia, the Russian people did not turn other peoples into slaves or into a source of their own enrichment, as the civilized West did, but helped them survive, survive and raise them in development to the level of Russian culture, formed them into equal allies.
In 1788, an event took place that has no analogues in world history. By decree of Catherine the Great, Russian Islam was officially invited as the second state religion, under the dominant orthodoxy, for the construction of a single spiritual, Eurasian, space of the empire. And this means that there are no fundamental disagreements between Russian Islam and orthodoxy. Colonizing and developing the vast expanses of Eurasia, the Russian people did not turn other peoples into slaves or into a source of their own enrichment, as the civilized West did, but helped them survive, survive and raise them in development to the level of Russian culture, formed them into equal allies. In 1788, an event took place that has no analogues in world history. By decree of Catherine the Great, Russian Islam was officially invited as the second state religion, under the dominant orthodoxy, for the construction of a single spiritual, Eurasian, space of the empire. And this means that there are no fundamental disagreements between Russian Islam and orthodoxy. To survive and raised them in development to the level of Russian culture, formed them into equal allies. In 1788, an event took place that has no analogues in world history. By decree of Catherine the Great, Russian Islam was officially invited as the second state religion, under the dominant orthodoxy, for the construction of a single spiritual, Eurasian, space of the empire. And this means that there are no fundamental disagreements between Russian Islam and orthodoxy. To survive and raise them in development to the level of Russian culture, formed them into equal allies. In 1788, an event took place that has no analogues in world history. By decree of Catherine the Great, Russian Islam was officially invited as the second state religion, under the dominant orthodoxy, for the construction of a single spiritual, Eurasian, space of the empire. And this means that there are no fundamental disagreements between Russian Islam and orthodoxy. Today, humanity is again waiting for Russia because Western civilization has once again led it into a historical dead end with its adventure of universal Westernization and an attempt to subordinate all civilizations and peoples to the interests of the oligarchic community. There is no one to break the deadlock and build a new world, except for us. Such, apparently, is the divine destiny of Russia and the Russian people. But this is not just an honorable mission, but also a serious geopolitical challenge for Russia itself. Is Putin ready for it? The answer lies in a simple truth, he, like Russia, like the peoples of the CIS countries, has no other choice. The only question is, does Putin, in his inner circle, have such fiery carriers, who are able not to enrich themselves and revel in power, but to serve a great idea, their fatherland? And this is another challenge for President Putin, his team. And not only in terms of the ability to organize the implementation of the president's ideas and plans, but also to be an authority, role model, because the reformatting of tasks for Russia in the 21st century will require, first of all, the formation of a different archetype of a mass person, a dreamer, morally pure, divine. Unfortunately, I do not see a single person in the presidential administration and government whom I would like to imitate. But, fortunately, there are millions of them outside the power structures, on the sidelines of official and behind-the-scenes reality. Unfortunately, I do not see a single person in the presidential administration and government whom I would like to imitate. But, fortunately, there are millions of them outside the power structures, on the sidelines of official and behind-the-scenes reality. Unfortunately, I do not see a single person in the presidential administration and government whom I would like to imitate. But, fortunately, there are millions of them outside the power structures, on the sidelines of official and behind-the-scenes reality. Putin will have to make a serious choice, to change the dullness of his environment for the brightness of selfless talents and wise men. Other challenges to Putin and Russia will come from abroad, primarily from the West. These are strategies of an anti-Russian nature, implemented through the planning and conduct of geopolitical operations. Here is some of them. Global governance is the creation of a world order where all countries and continents will perform the functions of a periphery, global village, serving the interests of the Judeo-Saxon elite and the financial oligarchy. The tools for solving these strategic tasks are a superior military force, an information psychological network of influence, a financial system, political arrogance, offensive activity of the fifth columns and all kinds of NGOs. Related tasks are Approval of money, material goods, as the meaning of human life, society, state. Rigid peg to the US dollar of all other currencies and the world economy. Opening of state borders for the unhindered movement of the dollar, goods and services purchased with it. Promotion to power under the guise of democracy, controlled elites and forcing them to act in the interests of the customer. 
the establishment of total control over the economic, political behavior of each person, enterprise, state, operations to abolish the international subjectivity of states. The goal is the destruction of the traditional role of the state in world and regional politics, the formation of a single planetary space without borders and national governments, the strengthening of the influence of transnational structures, regionalization, the weakening of the UN and other international organizations created on a state basis. Effect-Based Operations, 2004. The essence is a systemic destabilization of the basic political, economic, informational, infrastructural, social and military foundations of states, including Russia, through soft, power, natural disasters, information and psychological impact, political instability, etc. Purpose, strategic paralysis of the state administration system and its leading subsystems, the inability of the center to make adequate decisions. During the exercises of the armed forces of the United States and NATO, as the next stage of the operation, the issues of building up hard power at the request of local authorities of destabilized areas, certain political and social groups are being worked out. Operations to export instability are the most common in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. In the Balkans, the Middle East, the CIS space, Latin America, Africa. Russia ran into them in the North Caucasus, it runs into them every day in the spiritual space, on Bolotnaya Square, etc. The concept of a rapid global strike, 2003, is based on a sudden disarming strike by several thousand high-precision weapons against strategic nuclear forces and other especially important enemy targets, in order to prevent a retaliatory strike and force the target country, Russia, to surrender with subsequent democratization. These are the main, but by no means all, challenges for Russia and President V. Putin in the first half of the 21st century. To these should be added economic crises, inter-ethnic conflicts, political instability, etc. And the natural question is, what to do? First of all, do not proceed from the principle of fatality of such scenarios and find asymmetric responses to each of the challenges. What is needed is a deep analysis of the current situation, a real assessment of one's own potential, the identification of the opposing side's vulnerabilities and the adoption of appropriate decisions, invested with specific plans of preventive actions. With analytical security in Russia, things are not very good. On the one hand, there are many analytical structures, but they are unfocused and work outside the state strategy, one is not yet read at all, often against Russian interests. In the geopolitical sphere, to speed up the development of the structures of the New World Order, the Eurasian Union, the SCO, Euroasian Union, BRICS, the Union of Non-Western Civilizations. Propose a new format of the Council of the Sun, the basis of which as permanent members are representatives of world civilizations, North America, South America, Europe, Russia, China, India, the Islamic world, Africa, restore the status and international role of the SNS. Approve the geopolitical doctrine of Russia. The project is available in the Izborsk Club, in which to clearly identify what Russia wants, the type of civilizational order in accordance with which the world community is developing, geopolitical configuration of the world order, the role and place of Russia in world processes, in the economy, to abandon the course of catching up development and the role of a raw materials appendage of foreign economies, to adopt a course of advanced innovative development, jump, focusing the country's priorities on the development of education and science, on scientific discoveries and breakthrough technologies, simplicity, durability and reliability of Russian industrial products. In agriculture, declare war on artificial substitutes, genetically modified samples and assert the priority of our own natural food products. Offer humanity, through BRICS, a new economic strategy for world development, more humane and fair. In the spiritual and moral sphere, to consider this sphere the most important for the Russian state and its security. To protect spiritual borders is a hundred times tougher than land, sea, air. It is tough to oppose the Western approach to the problems of the family and society, false values, fascism and neo-racism implanted by the West, to return our own spiritual and moral values to Russian society. Actively promote your values to the world, carrying out peaceful spiritual expansion. To restore the foundations of the state ideology, to return the great Russian culture and the culture of the peoples of the USSR, squeezing out the surrogate show imposed in the last quarter of a century. The sphere of security is the most important, multidimensional and complex process, where the best scientific forces of the country should be concentrated. Ensuring the security of a person, 
society and country is the main function of any state and its head. Unfortunately, this area today is the most neglected in Russia and the most vulnerable to our opponents. Because, starting with Gorbachev, a false doctrinal attitude has dominated, the problems of our security lie in the plane of communist ideology and isolation from Western civilization. The geopolitical antagonism of the West towards Russia, which Russian classics wrote about back in the 19th century, its centuries-old focus on control over Russia as the center of Eurasia, historical experience, were ignored by the country's leadership. In recent decades, stakes have been placed on the nuclear missile potential as a guarantor of Russia's security, deterrent factor. But this is already a historical past. Today, our main adversary has gone far ahead both in the theory of modern confrontation and in the means of waging new types of wars and operations. A simple simulation of the likely scenarios of an annihilating strike against Russia by soft power and modern military means, which the United States and NATO are working out during exercises and headquarters electronic games, convinces Russia will not be able to use its nuclear missile potential in a retaliatory or counterattack. This means that in the near future, after the completion of the American Strategic Missile Defense Program, we may find ourselves unarmed in the face of the military might of the West. Useless in a fight with the United States will be tanks, planes, ships. They are needed in other strategic directions. 30,000 high-precision long-range cruise missiles, rocket-gliding warheads, range 5 to 10,000 kilometers, their hypersonic speed and powerful penetrating charge are the programs of the Pentagon being implemented. Plus unconventional strategic means, based on new physical principles, geophysical weapons, etc., the total development costs of which are comparable to the entire military budget of the Russian Federation. But the military aspect of security is far from all that potential adversaries are plotting against our fatherland. The security of the country is perhaps the most serious challenge for both Putin and Russia. It is necessary to answer it, again, not by catching up, but by running across. Of course, the security strategy should be worked out by specialists, if any. Here it is possible to designate only some directions of ensuring the strategic security of the country. The first is the formation of geopolitical alliances and coalitions of joint security, collective security systems. First of all, with China, in terms of interests and tasks, India, Brazil, etc. The second is active political and diplomatic activity to restore the system of international security and strictly observe the provisions of the UN Charter. Third, the creation of a grouping of forces and means capable of inflicting unacceptable damage on the territory of the United States, their very vulnerable life infrastructure, and the economic interests of the American elite at any moment. The grouping should not be a nuclear missile group from the strategic nuclear forces, but be deployed near the United States be on constant combat duty in readiness to hit targets within five to six minutes. Perhaps this will sober up hot American heads and provide the Russian leadership with an opportunity to restore military science, the military-industrial complex, and create a modern integrated security potential. And the last thing, to deeply understand the geopolitical laws and patterns of human development, because today geopolitics is the most powerful weapon. To be the head of any state is a great burden of responsibility. In Russia, this is a heavy cross. Let us wish and help VV Putin to raise the fatherland from its knees. Source, Izbosk Club, 2014, number 2. American tanks in Europe. Less than a year later, American tanks reappeared at NATO's European bases. According to the American publication, Stars and Stripes, Stars and Stripes. Approx, in aconweni.ru, 29 Abrams tanks of one of the latest modifications arrived at the German base near the city of Grafenwar. In addition to tanks, according to the publication, 33 Bradley armored personnel carriers and several dozen other armored vehicles will soon arrive there. Officially, we are talking about the supply of vehicles for training NATO contingents. However, Russian experts are confident that the return of new generation American armored vehicles to Europe has nothing to do with training. Against the backdrop of unrest in Ukraine, the Armored Corps is just an addition to the US Navy ships going to the Black Sea and the Strike Air Group, which is put on constant alert in Germany. As American journalists recall, last April, the last M1A1 Abrams tanks, probably 1984 model, approx, naconweni.ru, left the old world, and many saw this as the end of an era. However, the return of a new generation of tanks to Germany, M1A2 Sept V2 Abrams, 
modified in 2008. Approx NAConwene.ru suggests otherwise. In addition, more than 30 armored personnel carriers M2AZ, Bradley, and dozens of other armored vehicles should appear at the base. It is planned that this heavy equipment will be used to train specialists of various units on a rotational basis. The first in the course of the exercises of NATO troops, which are scheduled for 2014, the new tanks will run in the military personnel of the 1st U.S. Cavalry Division, the newspaper notes. However, if we compare the various events that have taken place in this region over the past month, there is reason to think. Europe is full of its own manufacturers of armored vehicles, for the training required to serve in Europe, these opportunities should be quite enough. Nevertheless, the Pentagon considers it expedient to send about 100 units of armored vehicles across the ocean to peaceful Europe as simulators. The other day, information appeared, which, however, was not confirmed by the Russian Ministry of Defense about the imminent arrival of a pair of warships of the U.S. Navy in the Black Sea Basin. Pentagon officials said the ships would be used for security during the Sochi Olympics and for the possible evacuation of American citizens in the event of an emergency. The type of ships was not further reported, however, the words of gratitude from the leader of the Ukrainian Freedom Oleg Tyagnibok for 600 cent US Marines suggest that at least one ship is a landing ship, moreover, it carries a serious contingent of trained Marines, and at all not in Sochi. At the same time, information was also announced that an air group was put on constant alert in Germany, which would carry out the same mission, evacuation of the Americans, however, how this would be done was not explained by the American admirals. Curious and one more fact. On January 24, the website of the U.S. State Department published an appeal to American citizens who are in Ukraine or are going to visit it, asking them to be careful. The most interesting thing is that the State Department, apparently, has specific data on when the unrest in Ukraine will end, on March 24, that is, exactly one week after the end of the Paralympic Games in Sochi. The timing associated with the Olympics cannot but be alarming. The well-known economist Mikhail D. Lyagin even warns in his blog that a possible escalation of violence will start on Friday, the opening day of the Olympics. By the way, it was on the opening day of the Beijing Olympics that the five-day war with Georgia began. The appearance of American tanks in Germany is clearly linked to the events in Ukraine. At the same time, there has been a split in the structure of NATO, both Europeans and Americans want to steer Ukraine. Israel has its own plans for this territory. About this, the day before. Yai, said Colonel General Leonid Ivashov, President of the Academy of Geopolitical Problems. Leonid Grigorievich, why are American tanks returning to Europe again? What is the need for this? NATO tanks can be used in Europe only in one direction, in the east. They will not go north or south. I do not exclude that this is connected with the events in Ukraine, it is clear what is next, Belarus, Russia, etc. Apparently, earlier the decision was made due to the fact that this space, Ukraine, Russia and Belarus, were conquered by political and economic methods, and pressure was carried out along the borders of Russia, and today, apparently, the question arises of the possible introduction of NATO forces into Ukraine with subsequent pressure on Russia. That's just how I view it. Moreover, there is an agreement between NATO and Ukraine of April 2004, according to which the territory of Ukraine is transferred to the disposal of NATO. This agreement has been ratified and has the status of law. Apparently, the Americans do not want only the Europeans, in the event of a dramatic development of the situation, participated in the events in Ukraine, they also want to take part in the creation of a zone of control over Ukraine. Therefore, they throw their tanks there. Is the departure of American warships to the Black Sea events from the same series? Yes, from the same series. After all, if the situation does not calm down in Ukraine, then I do not exclude that NATO, according to this agreement of 2004, will express concern and send in its troops, establish a temporary administration in Ukraine, with all the ensuing consequences. Crimea will be squeezed out from the Black Sea, and ground forces will go from here. In recent years, the Americans have tried to wage wars by someone else's hands, why are they now actively going to the front line themselves? Here there is a battle for Ukraine not only between the West and Russia, but also a battle within the West. The Americans want to have their influence here, their economic opportunities, they also put pressure on Russia through Ukraine. This is their anti-Russian dream, 
expressed by Brzezinski in the Grand Chessboard, that Russia without Ukraine becomes a regional Asian country. They are pursuing this line, control over Ukraine gives them the opportunity to put pressure on Russia, to influence the situation in Russia. And the Europeans, especially the Germans, see here a huge resource, a huge market from which they will suck resources, as they do with Bulgaria, Serbia, Poland, in order to recreate their Fourth Reich. In addition, the Americans expect to control the entire Caucasus, go to Iran, squeeze the Middle East from here, etc. And, of course, Israel. It was announced that the ships sent to the Black Sea would be nearby during the Olympics. Can holding these games become a backdrop for some military actions by NATO? I have been involved in international affairs for a long time, researching American behavior towards Russia. Since 1863, there has not been a single step that the Americans would have taken in favor of Russia, and not in their own favor. Therefore, all these good wishes, the desire to help the Russian services to ensure security at the Olympics, all this is a game, intrigue and lies. And if the Americans go with some goals, then outwardly they can imitate good undertakings, good actions, but they always keep an anti-Russian stone in their bosom. And here, these ships, I don't know how they will provide security at the Olympics. What, submarines will attack the Olympic facilities? Nonsense. But they will have headquarters, appropriate centers in order to monitor the situation. Their military presence will support these terrorist sentiments. Oleg Tyagnibok last week thanked the United States for the 600 Marines who, apparently, will arrive on these ships. What can be done with such powers? We are talking about the Crimean Peninsula. Today we see that violence is rising not in Sevastopol and in general not in the Crimean autonomy. They do not let these gangsters go there, and a large stratum of the military, including fleet veterans, families of officers of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, and the Ukrainian naval forces, their officers are also mainly opposed to the lawlessness that is happening. And a situation may arise when, during the period of split, the collapse of Ukraine, and this is the case, Crimea will declare itself an independent state, and Russia, of course, will support it. NATO will make a decision to create interim administrations, and these American Marines will come to take control of all administrative buildings, to establish their power, with all the ensuing consequences. Should the Russian army somehow react to such an environment, concentrate its forces, take certain actions to protect against provocations? Firstly, it is necessary to support the residents of Sevastopol through public organizations, primarily officer families. We need political support, the state could allocate a certain resource for economic support. Well, we need to strengthen our Black Sea fleet, show solidarity. Russia must clearly, through political parties and public organizations, declare, we are with you, we will not leave you in trouble. Here is a clear message from Russia to go to Sevastopol. Source, nakonu February 4, 2014. American Sergeant Ordered. The phrase of the Deputy Secretary of the Security Council of the Russian Federation E. Lukyanov dated July 2, 2014 caught my eye, U.S. hegemony on the world stage has come to an end, we need to sit down and negotiate on the results of the Cold War. What kind of Cold War to negotiate if the hegemony has come to an end and if this no longer hegemon controls the processes in Europe, Russia and Ukraine, etc. And not even Obama gives orders, but someone from the State Department at the level sergeant. Poroshenko immediately saluted, Merkel and Hollande, before executing the order, first make a thoughtful expression on their faces, the Russian foreign ministry sits down to write another condolence on the death of a Russian journalist. Is this how the world powers react to the global banditry of the non-hegemon? Sergeant McCain flew to Europe and banned the construction of the South Stream gas pipeline. Europe under the visor, Gazprom is whining, the Russian foreign ministry is shaming. And all because of Ukraine. Russia does not want the happiness of the independent, and the democratic West cannot sleep because of the Ukrainian misfortune. In order to reflect on the political settlement of the situation in Ukraine, it is necessary to objectively and deeply understand the reasons that caused the drama and tragedy of our once brotherly country. And let's start the analysis with the situation in the United States, because it is clear even to a non-specialist, the Americans are behind the events in Ukraine. And what do they wish the Ukrainian people? The answer is easy to read if you take a closer look at all the countries, happy, with American democracy, Yugoslavia, Iraq, 
Afghanistan, Libya, and Syria. The Americans intervened in each of them under the pretext of replacing dictatorship with democracy, restoring human rights, and giving impetus to economic development through the imposition of market relations. But this is just an excuse, nothing more. Let us first note three points, all the happy countries are friends of Russia, all modes who managed to bring Washington to power, pro-American satellites. In all such countries there is economic chaos, political instability, civil strife, and natural resources under the control of Anglo-American campaigns. The economic interest of the United States is obvious here, but it is not the main one. The main thing in political behavior is the geopolitical strategy of establishing world domination through the construction of a unipolar world, where only the United States should remain the main and only pole, and no one else can even claim to be America's competitor. This is precisely what is spelled out in the main American geopolitical document, the U.S. National Security Strategy of 1992, our strategy must be to prevent the emergence of any potential global rival. And this thesis is invariably repeated in all adjustments to the strategy. To implement this provision, a set of measures of a military, political, informational, economic and social nature, combined into geopolitical operations, has been developed and is being implemented. An obligatory condition for carrying out such is a clearly marked enemy. Until 2001, these were dictatorial regimes, allegedly suppressing the rights of national minorities, the overthrow of which, with active information support and control over Russian foreign policy, was not so difficult. Since September 2001, it has been international, Islamic, terrorism, because it was necessary to invade Islamic countries and establish pro-American democracy. The invasion of Afghanistan was covered by a purely fight against al-Qaeda, the Taliban, Osama bin Laden. Iraq was invaded under the pretext of fighting both the dictator and terrorism at the same time. Against Libya and then against Syria, the method was again used to eliminate the dictatorial regime and establish democracy. We remind the reader of the strategies used by the Americans in carrying out operations to overthrow objectionable regimes. Color revolutions in accordance with the methodological manual of the Institute. A. Einstein, Director J. Sharp, From Dictatorship to Democracy, which clearly spells out the sequence of actions of the opposition to carry out a coup d'etat. Creating a situation of controlled chaos and undermining the national economy, with a clear identification and promotion of the interests of American campaigns and the U.S. state. Inciting traditional and artificially created political forces against each other in order to provoke an eternal civil war. However, after analyzing the events in B. Yugoslavia and Iraq, as well as the situation with the election and subsequent expulsion of the pro-American Yushchenko in Ukraine, the Americans came to the conclusion that pro-American regimes are extremely unstable, unpopular, and can be overthrown at any moment. In 2006, G. Bush signed the Directive on Preemptive Actions. The essence of the directive is the development of the stage after the change of regime to pro-American. After the overthrow of the dictatorship, the directive sets the task of building a new nation, i.e., re-educating, re-identifying, the population into a new political nation. Naturally, loving America and hating the former cultural and civilizational tradition. To this end, a new type of information psychological operation was developed, and a core of civilian specialists was created in the Pentagon. In Iraq, re-education failed, in the former Yugoslavia, only half, but in Ukraine, a great success, although not complete. The core of a political nation, the most Russophobic on the planet, has been formed, which was allowed to pull national fascism, genocide out of the Zagashniks, trample on all international norms, commit pogroms and murders in order to make all of Ukraine an enemy of Russia and all Russian Orthodox. There is another stratagem in the annals of American world domination politics, to form and support counterbalancing states against the resurgent world centers of power, Poles Britain against Germany, Japan against China, Pakistan against India, Ukraine against Russia. A natural question arises, why does the United States need this if it is already a non-hegemon? The answer was given by an employee of the US NSA, who is also the executive director of the Institute for Global Perspectives, in the world rank, also not higher than a sergeant, Professor Paul Christie. Let us quote, without undue comment, some of his revelations to the weekly European Economic Bulletin, Germany, April 2014. A public debt of $17 trillion hangs like a sword of Damocles over the American economy and could lead to a global crisis. 
In order to resolve financial difficulties, the United States must take extraordinary measures, comparable only to a global cataclysm. The ability to pay off their debts without a significant drop in the standard of living of their population is feasible only at someone else's expense. Therefore, events should be organized in such a way that the whole world, each country, to one degree or another, become involved in resolving America's financial difficulties. The United States needs new markets comparable in scale to the US. The only such market now can only be the European market. We have been developing this project for many years. It is necessary to create such a situation in Europe that the Europeans themselves would refuse energy cooperation with Russia and would link their economic interest with energy supplies from the United States. Whether a united Ukraine will remain on the world map or fall apart, it has absolutely no significance for solving the main problem. The main task of the events in Ukraine is to separate Europe from Russia so much that the Europeans completely refuse cooperation with Russia and reorient their economy towards full cooperation with the United States. Ukraine is assigned the role of a blockage that will interrupt European cooperation with Russia. And what kind of system will be there, the form of government, these are completely uninteresting questions. The United States is pursuing solely its own goal of maintaining a world currency system based on the dollar. All events taking place in Ukraine should be considered exclusively from this perspective. A restless Ukraine should become an insurmountable barrier between Russia and Europe. To break Europe's economic ties with Russia, the Europeans must be so strongly intimidated by the Russian threat that they themselves would want to do it, it is necessary to radically change the European public opinion about cooperation with Russia. Europe's rejection of Russian and Middle Eastern energy carriers will lead to huge investments in American production of shale gas, will lead to the creation of a powerful infrastructure for its processing and delivery to Europe, which will allow the United States to quickly eliminate its financial problems. Clearly, clearly, and quite cynically. American style. Order. From the EU, no discussion, discussion. For the sake of solving the main task, saving the dollar as a means of survival for the United States and robbing the rest of the world, the Americans encourage fascism in Ukraine, the destruction of the population of the southeast, where large deposits of shale gas have been discovered, protect Bandera, shoot journalists who carry the truth. And what about Europe, which the states consider as a sacrificial ram? After all, the absorption of the European market, which means the liquidation of the euro area, is nothing but the transformation of Europe into a colony of the United States. There are passages in P. Christie's interview, such as, Europe owes its well-being to the United States, America provided the Europeans with security, etc., and now Europe is obliged to help the Americans save the dollar, the economy, and the country as a whole. Of course, at the cost of a complete loss of their independence in all spheres of life, except perhaps for football. What is already manifested in the Ukrainian issue, the imposition of sanctions against Russia, in the blockade of objective information. Has Europe matured? Hardly. Because of all the regions of the world, the most American abiding region is Europe. Russia is in second place. The cohort of independent politicians in Europe, such as de Gaulle, Jake Chirac, G. Cole, has ended, the era of Sarkozy has come, and for those, any secretary of the US State Department is a big boss. For Poroshenko and his junta, any sergeant in the American army is the boss. And not only European politicians subordinate to the US State Department, but also the most, independent, European media. Hundreds of millions of Europeans are fooled hourly by American lies. The answer to the question why the West lacks objective information about the events in Ukraine was given by the famous Italian writer and politician Jake Chiesa in an interview with Komsomolskaya Pravda on May 3, 2014. In essence, an army of propagandists was created in the West under the guise of journalism. These are millions of people who receive the salary they live on. If we talk about the informal center, then it consists of the New York Times, the Washington Post, the CNN television channel, the British news agency Reuters, and the American Associated Press. These are the five centers that set the tone for the entire world press. All other versions become marginal. Here Russia has made a big strategic mistake over the years. Your leaders did not understand that there is not a single voice in the West that could convey Russia's point of view. Absent completely. We do not have an alternative version of events through the eyes of Russia. There is no television, no newspapers, no such instruments. Or they are marginal. 
So it turns out that all 60 million Italians listened to only one voice during the two months of the development of the Ukrainian crisis. Could a non-hegemon forbid Europe and Russia to simultaneously read and listen only to his voice and no one else? Among other things, the United States has silenced the Europeans and the Russian authorities in the field of international law. The coup d'etat in Ukraine, national fascism, the genocide of one's own people are presented as democracy, they bow to the false president, because Saki and Newland are on his side. Thousands of people are dying, journalists are systematically shooting back, life support infrastructure is being destroyed, hundreds of thousands of refugees are being destroyed in response to the miserable grumbling of European and Russian top officials, an imitation of a ceasefire and a truce, which was immediately cancelled by an American sergeant. But international law clearly spells out the people's right to self-determination. All peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of this right, they determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, political and social development. The creation of a sovereign and independent state, free accession to or association with an independent state, or the establishment of any other status freely determined by a people, is a way for that people to exercise the right to self-determination, UN Charter, Paragraph 2, Art. 1. International Covenants on Human Rights, Article 1.1966, 1970. What did the residents of Donbass and Lugansk do wrong? All in accordance with international law. I will add that recognition or non-recognition by other states in no way affects the status determined by the people. And if so, then the conflict in the southeast is acquiring a different character than is interpreted, including by the Russian foreign ministry. This is not an internal conflict and not a civil war, but the aggression of Kiev against independent states, on the part of which the war is of a national liberation nature, which is also provided for and regulated by international law. And the militia of Donbass and Lugansk are not separatists and terrorists, but legitimate military personnel, combatants who enjoy international legal protection. Why are diplomats, deputies, Euro-Russian politicians silent about this? And why do we dance so humiliatingly in front of the bandits, bombarding Russian territory with large-caliber shells, that we even invite them to our border checkpoints to see the results of the attack and somehow reassure them? This absurdity was noticed even by the well-known scientist from Armenia Vazgan Avagayan, Economics and Us, dated 2 July 2014, it is unpleasant for me to look at the government of the Russian Federation for its apologies for its own existence, the genocide of Russians in Ukraine is custom-made, carried out by professional killers on the orders of the customer. Russians are faced with the choice of war or death, which shows the paranoid nature of the thinking of the Western so-called partners, with whom the elite of the Russian Federation is constantly trying to negotiate due to naivety and weakness, cowardice and meanness. The answer is simple, the American sergeant ordered that we even invite them to our border checkpoints to see the results of the attack and somehow convince them. This absurdity was noticed even by the well-known scientist from Armenia Vazgan Avagayan, Economics and Us, dated 2 July 2014, it is unpleasant for me to look at the government of the Russian Federation for its apologies for its own existence, the genocide of Russians in Ukraine is custom-made, carried out by professional killers on the orders of the customer. Russians are faced with the choice of war or death, which shows the paranoid nature of the thinking of the Western so-called partners, with whom the elite of the Russian Federation is constantly trying to negotiate due to naivety and weakness, cowardice and meanness. The answer is simple, the American sergeant ordered that we even invite them to our border checkpoints to see the results of the attack and somehow convince them. This absurdity was noticed even by the well-known scientist from Armenia Vazgan Avagayan, Economics and Us, dated 2 July 2014, it is unpleasant for me to look at the government of the Russian Federation for its apologies for its own existence, the genocide of Russians in Ukraine is custom-made, carried out by professional killers on the orders of the customer. Russians are faced with the choice of war or death, which shows the paranoid nature of the thinking of the Western so-called partners, with whom the elite of the Russian Federation is constantly trying to negotiate due to naivety and weakness, cowardice and meanness. The answer is simple, the American sergeant ordered. 2014, it's unpleasant for me to look at the government of the Russian Federation for its apologies for its own existence, the genocide of Russians in Ukraine is custom-made, carried out by professional killers on the orders of the customer. The Russians are faced with the choice of war or death, which shows the paranoid nature of the thinking of Western so-called 
partners, with whom the elite of the Russian Federation is constantly trying to negotiate due to naivety and weakness, cowardice and meanness. The answer is simple, the American sergeant ordered. 2014, it's unpleasant for me to look at the government of the Russian Federation for its apologies for its own existence, the genocide of Russians in Ukraine is custom-made, carried out by professional killers on the orders of the customer. The Russians are faced with the choice of war or death, which shows the paranoid nature of the thinking of Western so-called partners, with whom the elite of the Russian Federation is constantly trying to negotiate due to naivety and weakness, cowardice and meanness. The answer is simple, the American sergeant ordered. The elite of the Russian Federation is constantly trying to negotiate with whom, out of naivety and weakness, cowardice and meanness. The answer is simple, the American sergeant ordered. The elite of the Russian Federation is constantly trying to negotiate with whom, out of naivety and weakness, cowardice and meanness. The answer is simple, the American sergeant ordered. Source, Soviet Russia, the 5th of July 2014. Thank you for downloading the book in the free electronic library royalib.ru, https colon double forward slash royalib.ru. Leave a review about the book, https colon double forward slash royalib.ru forward slash book forward slash evas h of underscore leonid forward slash radicalnaya underscore dukatrina underscore nova rostu dot html. All books by the author, https colon double forward slash royalib.ru forward slash author forward slash evas h of underscore leonid dot html.